now recording. Okay. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Turn Up the Podcast. I'm Mike, he, him. And tonight I'm here with Ford, he, him. And my guests. Oh, okay. Looks like we have Jaron Sterling now. And so we also have Sterling, he, him. And Jaron, he, him. And our guests tonight are Ben, he, him. And Zulu, he, him. How are you guys doing? All right. Yeah, how about you? Pretty good. I'm doing great. Good, good. Good. I wasn't sure if you could hear. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to have a, uh, a debate episode tonight. More of like a panel. Um, so I also I actually wanted to introduce this with sort of like a, just a preamble because I haven't released any of the recent quote unquote debate episodes that we've been doing. And I've been doing a, a couple of them. I think we've done, yeah, this will be the fourth. And I did one, the first one was by myself with another guest. And I was letting the kids in the Discord hear some clips of it earlier today because I was actually on the fence about whether or not to even release it um, because of uh, some of the views this person was expressing. I don't know. I just don't know if it's even worth platforming them, even if I'm countering them with an argument right there. Um, so it's still kind of an ongoing discussion in the Discord. We'll see how that plays out. The second one, I think, went much better. Sterling, you were there for that one. I think that went really well, and we had a really good discussion with those two guys. That one, I think, will definitely be released pretty soon. And then the third, I did another one with a, a one-on-one, and I think that one was also kind of unproductive, a little on the sillier side. But uh, yeah, I'll put that in the Discord as well and see what the consensus is. But so that's where we're at. This will be the fourth one. And I did post on Reddit to start all these, and I just asked people to basically come defend capitalism. And I was admittedly very trolly in the in the post to begin with. And, and in the comments and everything, I've been trolling people left and right on Reddit. Um, but that is the basic premise, is to come defend capitalism. And I did say that I wanted to keep even teams of people on the left and the right, so from our side and theirs. But tonight, after I showed all of my co-hosts Prax Ben's TikTok channel, everybody wanted in on this. Like, And we were debating... Do we ask Ben to do two episodes and split it up with like a team of two and a team of three or something? Or do we just have everybody on and agree to keep it civil and make sure that we allow everyone to speak their piece and not interrupt each other or whatever? Since we've been able to do that in the past, and I think we've been pretty successful at it. So I think that's what we're going to do. And if at any point, Ben and Zulu, you guys are not okay with it, you feel like you're, I don't know, outnumbered or ganging up on you or whatever, just say so. It's, I mean, we'll, we, we can back off. We can be nice. But uh, so yeah, so that's the, the basic introduction to the, the night. And then I guess I would like to hand it over to you, Ben and Zulu, if you want to just outline your political stances, I guess, and kind of where you are. Uh, Sterling, what do you got? Sorry. I just, I just wanted to test my mic real quick. Can you guys hear me fine? Yep, you're good. All right, cool. cool. And you're also, we're streaming on YouTube, so please don't say anything to dox yourselves. Drop so social security anything. numbers, addresses. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, we don't usually do that. So, okay. Uh, let me hand it to you, Ben and Zulu, and uh, tell us about your uh, political platforms, I guess. Yeah, so uh, I'm Prax Ben. Um, I'm mostly on TikTok. I'm also on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, a few other things as well. Um, but yeah, TikTok's my primary uh, social media. Um, I mostly post uh, videos concerning economics, uh, occasionally social issues, but I'm, I'm very passionate about, about economics and uh, economic history especially. Um, I'm very anti-communist. I consider myself a anarcho-capitalist. Um, I'm of the Austro-Libertarian variety. Uh, I'm a fellow with the Henry Hazlitt Fellowship and uh, associated with the uh, Ludwig von Mises Institute, so that's kind of the types of groups I like being around. Yeah, I mean, that's about it. Uh, I'm, I'm just here to defend capitalism in general. Of course, we weren't really planning on talking about anarcho-capitalism. If that topic comes up, uh, maybe we can have a few words about it, but I'd mostly like to talk about, you know, capitalism and communism sounds good so uh i'm uh fairly similar in that i'm also a youtuber in the austro-libertarianism uh, type of sphere um i focus mostly on uh, ethics as ben mentioned when we were talking before the show uh, but i do dabble in economics here and there where it's necessary uh, i would describe my political opinion sort of um I am a full-on anarcho-capitalist, and I define anarcho-capitalism as uh, Austrianism as applied to anarchism. So Austrian economics is all about applying the science of praxeology, which is the general science of human action, to economics, where basically all of economics is derived from the core axiom of human action. And uh, anarcho-capitalists say that, well... We can also apply praxeology in ethics and law as well. And that's where anarcho-capitalists come in. We are applying praxeology to law. Yeah, so 
Is Zulu, is that a dick behind you? Yes. Oh yeah, he drew a dick on his white. Okay, just just, just making sure. Just making sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and do your do, are your balls above the shaft like that? <laughs> is is that a fair representation? <laughs> well, I was hanging down from the, the ceiling when I was uh, tracing it out. You know. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm familiar with praxis, but I've never heard of praxeology until now. Can you could you give me like a brief explanation of praxeology if you wouldn't mind? Uh, sure. So, like, um, I'll I'll give mine. Uh, ben might uh, be able to go more into it. Uh, but praxeology to me, basically, it's the science of human action. So you have the core axiom of human action of sorry of praxeology, which is the axiom of human action, where basically it means that men act. So action here is being defined as when uh, a person is they have some end that they want to achieve, some goal in mind and they realize this goal and they need to allocate scarce means in order to get that goal so if i want to uh, have some nicotine in my lungs right now i have that end in mind and i have a means which i can achieve this end with this vape pen and if i then i have achieved my end mm -hmm. and it's basically that generalized completely and applying it to different things if I were to add anything, I would note that in praxeology, human action is uh, voluntary actions. So say you take a hammer and hit my knee and I react, that's not human action. And uh, human action mostly comes from uh, some form of discomfort, whether it be physical or mental or spiritual, any, any sort of discomfort, right? And then you're acting upon something to ease that discomfort. So let's say you're sitting there inactive and then you hear a fly buzzing and that's causing you some sort of discomfort. If you go to stop the fly to ease that discomfort, then you're acting. Um, but if it's a plane that's flying over that's causing some buzzing sound, you can't really do anything about it unless you have a, an anti-air cannon. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, I don't know. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think that's something that really uh, helps people grasp that. Um, and of course, you know, if you're hungry, you go and eat, you're, you're trying to achieve some sort of end goal and that end goal is typically easing some sort of dis discomfort. So inherently reactionary. Wait, what? Why is it? Re <laughs> it just from what he described, it sounds like everything oh, is because reaction. Yeah. yeah. So you guys see capitalism as facilitating the means to the ends that you're describing. Well, I would say that um, capitalism, I'm not so... Um fond of using that term to describe a political system. I think that uh, capitalism, when anarcho-capitalists are... Capitalism, qua anarcho-capitalism, I should say, is really talking about Austrian economics, which is a positive, value-free science. It's not saying that this is how things should be done. It's saying, right, this is how things are. These are the effects if things are arranged in this way. So, you know, if we want to, you know, let's just say capitalism is like where you have free trade, no interference with free trade then this would be uh, in my view an entirely just system so any other system would be unjust objectively speaking it's not just that i want this system because it'll achieve some end goal of mine i'm saying this is the system which should be implemented no matter what i want yeah i mean like he said praxeology and uh austrian methodology is descriptive and not normative so you can technically be like an Austrian and be a socialist, technically. I mean, maybe not really, but what you're doing is you're observing, you know, like you have an axiom, you have some truths that you can start with, and then from that you can deduce more truths. Um, and, and given all of these truths, we can see that socialism, for example, to put it simply, wouldn't work, right? Or socialism would have catastrophic consequences, or having a free market would be much better in terms of actual well-being uh and of course ethics is a is another separate thing um yeah that's a little bit to that's a little bit to unpack but as far as socialism you you mean communism socialism could technically exist under that because it socialism is nothing but the existence of communism and capitalism side by side whether it's transferring from one to the other there's one specific direction I would be questioning if anyone's read history if they decided to take that route. But yeah, I would say socialism, sure. But communism, yeah, no. Yeah, I think definitions are definitely something that's very important starting out. Um, we can't really debate on 
capitalism and communism if we don't have um, definitions or at least understand where the other people are coming from. So as capitalism, I would just be describing a free market, an unhampered market. Um, you know, personally, I'm an anarcho-capitalist. I would, I would appreciate a classical liberal system or a or a minarchist system, of course, because that's very that's fairly close to what I want. Um, socialism, I see as rather broad. I mostly see socialism as some sort of systemic restriction or attack on private property and private property claims. So I think there's many different types of socialism. You can have market socialism. Uh, I think there's, you know, non-Marxist socialist, of course, you know, back before Marx and in Marxist day, you had utopian socialists. So I think there's lots of different types of socialist. Um, I think there's some, some that aren't even close to Marxism. Um, and then with communism, I usually see that as more explicitly uh, Marxist as like the what Marxists see as the uh, the next stage of development after capitalism. So it would be fair to say that both of you and don't let me put words in your mouth here. Both of you consider private property to be something that uh, ostensibly would be infinite. You can have as much private property as you can acquire. Yeah. Okay. And how does that interface with the idea that resources are finite? Well, it's implied by the fact that resources are finite. It's the fact that we have finite resources, that we have scarce means. <clears throat> sorry, uh, that this implies that there can indeed be conflicts. And the fact that there can indeed be conflicts means that we need uh, an area of philosophy called law where we deal with, okay, how exactly do we resolve these conflicts? Do we give precedence to the initiator of this conflict or the non-initiator of this conflict? Because they can't both win by definition of what a conflict is. It's contradictory action. Only one can win because their actions are mutually exclusive. So it's like if, you know, Crusoe and Friday, they have a stick here and Crusoe wants to use it for spear fishing. Friday wants to use it to stoke his fire. They can't both do that at the same time. One of them has to win out. And our capitalists are saying that the person who didn't initiate the conflict should win out. And you were trying to speak, I think. Oh, but I appreciate your answer here. So let me take it a step further. In the event of, let's say, Nestle taking control of the California river systems in central and northwest California. They obtained the river rights back in the 1890s, and as of current day, after about a 10-year drought when water is looking more and more scarce in that area of the world, people are having less and less uh, reliable water access. Places like Jackson, Mississippi experience this. Places like um, uh, Flint, Michigan experience this, which also has a privatized company taking water rights. So. That initial right in the 1890s um, being used as license to continue to take water from people who need it to live, who is the aggressor in that situation? Um, I mean, if, if we're, because I don't know the specifics of the situation, but if we just assume sure. that they do actually own these rivers, then yeah, other people trying to steal water from them, they are initiating a conflict. So even if those people will die if they do not get this water. Yes, and I actually have a, an analogy to kind of paint well, yeah, the picture I mean, here. I really, I did want to ask, that was what I had before. I wanted to ask you guys to give a take on enclosure and or primitive accumulation. And I'm assuming that you guys are familiar with those terms. I don't have to explain them, but if I do, that's fine. It, by enclosure, do you mean like if I own like a ring of land around like something unowned in the middle? Yeah. So right. there's like, there's the, I guess the abstract concept of enclosure, which is like you cordon off a section of land and then decide that it is now your private property and restrict others from, you know, using whatever resources are available on that land. And then the, I guess the more Marxist version of that is the specific, I guess we define it as like an epoch or an era of enclosure. And it's usually referring to like feudal England when like they had people who were like just subsistence farming or whatever on just communal land. And then at some point people decided they could fence it in. And a lot of times they were, it was mutually beneficial because they were protecting people from like, you know, barbarians or whatever other people were wandering around, like, you know, robbers or whatever. Um, but this led to feudalism and then eventually to capitalism. And that's at least the Marxist conception of it is that when people started enclosing land, that led to the system that we have today. And then when you get to the point where all of land in the world is privately owned or at least spoken for, then you have the conflicts that we have today. And then capitalism is basically just the extension of feudalism with that same kind of inequality just codified in a different way. 
but or did you have something quick? Because I wanted to see what they yeah, say um, like a good modern day example would be um, like when we had our friend um, Jared on from Australia talking about water rights in Australia and how these far uh, massive farms are just cutting off access to the river that's not actually on their land, but not being held responsible and causing droughts in urban, not urban, but um, small communities along those areas. Like now they have no water because of these large farms that aren't being held responsible. Well, I'll um I'll get onto the enclosure thing in a bit because that is uh, quite a deep theoretic thing in anarcho capitalism, and um, uh, you know there are entire paper chains about that. Uh, but just for uh the you know I own a river or like a let's just say a well, right? I just own a well, and you know uh, everybody else around me they need water to live, and there's no other sources of water around, and I don't want to give them any of my water. Is it just for them to steal water from me? My answer would be yeah. no, and I can kind of illustrate this with an easier example to see why it would be wrong to steal the water. And imagine I had a disease where I will die in a week if I do not have sex with a woman, and no one when, woman wants to have sex with me. Would I be allowed to force them to have sex with me? Obviously not. But why is it any different in the case of a bunch of people having wells, and none of them want to give me their water? <laughs> the fact that you have to make that analogy means that you yeah, yeah, can't yeah. defend it on its face, dude. That's a weird one. But would you have? Said? But do you think it's disanalogous? Uh, it, 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 no, it's it's it, it is all. no, not at all. Um, you're talking about uh, one person who has the ability to either extend help to countless people around them versus one person who's going through an element that has the opportunity to have many people extend it. You might find yourself surprised if you had a disease in which if you did not have sex and it was not transmissible and, and someone had to have sex with you, you might find yourself surprised that some people would volunteer and help you out. Indeed, Unless, exactly. of course, you were hogging sorry, the water. Sorry. And, and I should some, have raised my hand. Um, I'll, I'll let Ben speak. If I may, that's actually a, a, a great point that you just made, and I think that actually kind of helps our, our position, right? You just said... You think some people would voluntarily be like, yeah, yeah, I would help you. Um, that's the way I see it. I mean, I think there's some instances, you know, where, where you're, you're just holding your ethics consistent. And it's like, oh, well, you know, on the surface level, with my intuition, that seems kind of bad. But it's like, well, would that actually happen? Would, would these types of things continually happen? I mean, personally, from the research I've done on um, water privatization, water privatization has consistently improved access for... Uh, for consumers, especially in the third world. Uh, Argentina is a really great example. After the privatization of water, um, the quality drastically improved. The uh, child mortality rates uh, improved very quickly. Um, so the way I see it is, I mean, technically, yes, yeah, someone could say, oh, I'm not going to give anybody water. I'm going to have a bunch of water, do nothing with it, not going to give anybody to it. But I don't think that happens 99.99% .99 of the time because it's it's a very unreasonable irrational thing to do that most people just don't want to do i uh, i would like to respond to kind of both of those points um i'll go in reverse order they're not going to keep the water and do nothing with it they're going to sell it for profit which is yep. what i would say is the problem because Based. they're taking something that like costs nothing and now they're going to sell it for profit <laughs> and they may use the excuse that they're bottling it and transporting or whatever but they're going to make a bunch of money i would say that i would have a bunch of disagreements with doing that to begin with but whatever uh, I wanted to address the analogy because I wasn't going to go after the way that Sterling did. I thought that was funny, but like <laughs> the whole thing about like the disease where you have sex with somebody, I think the fact that you have to make that analogy uh -oh. is really funny. Like if you have to remove it that far where you're now talking about violating someone's bodily autonomy, um, like literally entering someone's body as opposed to like taking some water that a person quote unquote owns. Like the fact that anybody even talks about owning a river is hilarious to me. And it may sound like hippie shit to you guys, but, like, I just can't get down even with the concept of owning a piece of land. And, I mean, I could talk about that for a long time, but, like, to even compare that, like I said, to entering someone's person, it's really funny to me. And I would like you to just try to defend the concept of withholding water from people who are going to die without it, uh, just, right, like, without trying to remove it from that and make it that abstract, you know? Sure. So, uh, I mean... There is a very good reason why I use that analogy, because they are analogous. Uh, you know, they're both initiations of conflict. They're both aggression. And, you know, in oh, one case, we're saying very clearly, no, you're not allowed to aggress against these women. And in the other case, if these women, instead of having their body, 
you have some water, oh, you are allowed to aggress against them, right? Because there's aggression in both cases. In either case, you are initiating a conflict with them, and that's what's wrong about it. Okay, so I would say the person who was initiating the conflict is the person who enclosed the water and prevented others from getting a resource that was just there, that this person had nothing to do with creating, and just enclosed this resource. So that is the aggression right there, is preventing other people from doing it. And this is not like an original concept either. Like, I was I was just recommending this week to people, they should check out a book called Ishmael and the sequel, The Story of B. And it's a really funny and kind of wacky book, but like the premise is this dude answers an ad in the newspaper that says like, seeking a student with a genuine desire to save the world. He ends up talking to an ape telepathically and the ape basically this is, this is the him. alex jones book he was talking about this on uh one of those podcasts he? he was on yeah <laughs> this has oh, become like funny. a it was like a big meme i think it was tim pool's podcast i'm it's a gorilla a, I mean, kill yourself because it's it's so liberal and it's like a very like baby brained like class conscious take and it's really funny and it's great for like liberals to read but like now i think it would even be old hat because everybody's starting to get really cool with the concept of socialism and communism which i'd love to see but I saw that Ward and Jaron both had things. Did you guys want to go? Yeah, I had a really quick point, and then I'll pass it off to Jaron. I uh, just to address um, what Ben, what you were saying about like just how people wouldn't make like unethical decisions, like oh, they would give things away, like the belief that people would act unselfishly. Um, that's something that's like a core tenet of communism, you know, being optimistic and knowing how good people are, but. The problem with when it occurs under capitalism is nothing is unethical under capitalism as long as it makes a profit because that's the ultimate motive is profit. So as long as it's profitable, it's ethical, whether it's slavery or stealing water rights or what have you. If it's making a profit, it's ethical. Uh, if I were to just... Sorry, yeah. This is this is one of the problems when you have so many people and I, I forget to raise my hand. Um yeah, I mean, to quickly to respond to that, I don't think I was implying that people would just do unselfish things. I mean, I think it could be selfish in a way. I think you can benefit people in selfish ways. I mean, I'm not an objectivist, so I wouldn't defend to my dying breath. Uh, oh, uh, selfishness is a virtue. Everything, you know, everything good is selfish and stuff like that. I mean, I do think they could just uh, altruistically give water away, maybe, or they could sell it. Um, but the way I see it, the way I see economics, I think selling it is a good process. Um, th there's There's been many instances, especially in Latin America, where people privatized water systems. And a lot of people can complain. They're like, oh, we have to pay, you know, 15% more for our water now. But through that, with the actual profits they're making, they were able to improve systems. They were able to improve uh, phone services, uh, repair services. Um, expand access to more people. So, I mean, the way I see it is when you are serving a profit system, you tend to go in a good direction. And with things like slavery, I mean, I, I, my ethics are outside of what we're talking about, you know, with uh, descriptive economics. So, I mean, I, just ethically, I would be against slavery. But in terms of profit, I do think slavery and serfdom and things like that are bad for profit as well. Interesting. Oh, take. I just wanted to so say much to unpack here. <laughs> let me do. Let me do one quick one, just based on something you said. Right, that you, you're so. It's fair to say that you believe whoever held that property, whoever owned that property first, is can make the decision of what they want to do with it. Mm -hmm. As long that, as they're not infringing on other people's property. If I have a property right in okay. something, then oh, I'm by definition the allowed to do it. Okay, uh, and and we are all aware that it was not a white man occupying that land to begin with right okay and if somebody can come along and say actually i own that land you know if there, some native american comes along and says actually my great 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 great, great great all right and if some if an individual native american comes along they say hey my great 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 grandpappy or whatever actually homesteaded this land this is where his house yep. was built and then this guy came along and destroyed it that. yeah yeah they, and then, they, then they would be just in taking that land back they do it, and they have documents signed by the okay, federal and government then, saying and they're, they're just, right, and they still can't have it back. Right, that's because the U.S. government is a socialist nightmare, right? They're, they're, <laughs> they're forestalling that land. The, the genuine owners want to come along and get it back, and the U.S. government is saying, actually, nah, because they've monopolized the courts, right? They've monopolized the courts, so whatever they say goes. That's socialism, yeah. Yeah. They've socialized um, the courts. 
Jaren, what did so, you I, I'm going to try to take this piece by piece. First off, the thing with uh, privatizing water, um, as we've seen in Chile, is a massive disaster. According to the National Resources Defense Council, water accessibility has actually gone down in the past five and six years. There's been massive protests about this. Um, including about 19 million people living in areas that suffer from severe water scarcity. So like painting that as somehow a more equi equitable or good thing is just realistically false. That literally did not happen. It got better for some people and it got way worse for 19 million people. Now, as far as slavery not being a good thing for capitalist economies, here's just a figure that has been referenced. And it's really hard to calculate this because no one was documenting this labor proper, properly or ethically. But the numbers show that during American slavery, it generated about $42 trillion work dollars worth of modern day value. The reason the U.S. went from just a few colonies to what it is now, the, the military powerhouse, the, the godhead of the whole fucking world, is because it was built on the backs of slaves. So capitalism and, and the slavery that constituted it generated $42 trillion worth of wealth that has trickled down into creating this country. Both of those points are, are empirically false. They're painted up to look nice for this position, but they're not correct. Here's a, an interesting little question about empiricism, right? Like you, you said, well, um, before privatization, there was more water than after privatization. So therefore, it must be privatization which caused it. Well, you know, I, I would say that there was a big meteor which hit the earth, killed off all the dinosaurs and whatnot. Before that meteor hit, no humans around. After that meteor hit, bunch of humans around. So do meteors improve the human population? Do we get more humans whenever you launch meteors at the earth? I don't think so. So you can't just say, well, before this, this, it was look an, this way, and then after an, it's this the other way. I mean, before an, there were no protests and 19 million people had better water access. Like, I, I don't it's not hypothetical. The demonstrate the cause, like, demonstrate that it's causal, though. You have to demonstrate that this has caused the water shortage. But, like, it okay, happened like, right after yeah, privatization. <laughs> This doesn't but, demonstrate. I'll, I'll let somebody else talk. <laughs> I know, but like, I just want to say, like, real quick, Ben. A minute ago, like, you were saying that water privatization gave water access to blah blah blah. And Zulu, I noticed you didn't challenge him on empiricism there. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is this is what I want to say, right? Because I gave a reason. I gave I gave a reason as to why what I said would be true. He did not. I, I, I'm sorry. I don't know your name. Wait, Jaren, J Jaren did not. Um. So, like, I gave I gave a reason. I gave an explanation. I can give you guys multiple citations on this. I can even talk about um, privatizations in, in certain Latin American countries that I think were completely corrupt and bad. Because I I don't see giving a particular company a monopoly on water is much better than having the government on it. And sometimes it can even be worse depending on who you're actually giving it to. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's a huge problem. I think I think corrupt privatization processes are a huge problem. I support free marketization not just privatization privatization is a very broad term you know you had like privatization in in uh, germany in the in the 1930s that wasn't making a free market it was handing over state owned enterprises to you know party members and stuff like that and it's very similar in in latin america sometimes i think argentina is the best example of it going going right um there's a few others i could give but Okay, so I, I kind of want to hold you to this thing where you say you can give reasons, because that's actually what I really like to do when I have these discussions or any kind of debates, panels, or whatever. I like to hear people just give their layman's terms take as to how this, like explain it in your own words as to how the privatization specifically helped them. And then I guess give your take on what Jaron is saying about the lack of water access after privatization and the protests that were occurring. Like, how do you explain that? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I'm not... Oh, sorry, I'll let you speak. I've been talking my ass off. I'm not super familiar with uh, Chile's privatization. I would have to uh, look more into that specifically. Um, but the reason I would say that privatization tends to be better, um, uh, according to the, the World Bank um, put out a report on this not too long ago, and they said during the 90s alone, about 20 million people got, great, got access to clean water because of various privatization campaigns across the, across the global south. So privatization... In general, especially when you're going in a more free market, 
free market route. You're taking industries that are typically operated um, at cost, right? So they're, they're not making profits. And then you're putting to where they are making profits and, and people are, you know, they're starting to build up more capital and then they can go and invest in more capital goods. Um, like I like I mentioned earlier, in places like Guatemala, what they did is they improved cell uh, cell phone services or sorry telephone services, so you could call in, say you're having a problem. Um, they improve access to more people because more people's more consumers, right? Typically, uh, it's not a very good model to just focus on richer people. That's why most firms, most products everywhere are not luxury products it's typically good to focus on getting as many people as possible. So they're expanding access, you know, with all these profits, they, they consistently reinvest the profits. Um, they uh, replace water lines, make things much cleaner. Um, and like I said, I can give you guys some specific examples if you want to look at them. Argentina is a, a really great example, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, I mean, if you, if you just look up um, uh, what's the uh, water for life? The impact of privatization of water services on child mortality. Um, that's a really great study on the privatization in uh, in Argentina. Now you have a response to that, or can I uh, jump I in? Wanna, I, um, I also did want to hear either of you guys have a, a response to like the. I think Ben, you were just saying you just don't know enough about the Chile protest to have a comment. Yeah, I mean, I, which is a fair so, thing. That's fair. I what mean. what I think is that they probably went a very poor route. Like I said, I would have to do research into it. A lot of <laughs> agreed, countries, agreed. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, a lot of countries have done like water privatization in the past thirty years. So it's it's a lot to keep up with. Um, Chile, I yeah, I mean, may, maybe they just handed it over to one company, and that company isn't managing things very well. I would say one a company running a monopoly isn't going to be much more efficient than the government running a monopoly. I, I could I could give a few ideas as to what I think maybe uh, why there were protests after it. Basically, you know, uh, my first idea might be that well, uh, when you have a misallocation of resources, i.e., resources are allocated where they shouldn't be because of some government central planning reallocating them away from where private owners would be allocating them. In the case where you have uh, publicized water, when you try and privatize that. You have a, there's an analogy which can be drawn to the Austrian business cycle theory, where if you're constantly misallocating all this money, you're, you know, that all these uh, investment projects, they're investing in the wrong projects, there's all this other stuff. There is a period of recession, you know, everyone has to downsize, everyone has to figure out what they can do with all these projects. An analogy can be drawn there to, you know, what happens when you instantly privatize something. It was being misallocated before. That's kind of like the boom, and then once you're in the bust, it's it sucks for a while. It sucks for a while, but in the long run, it'll be a lot better, right? Uh, another idea I might have is perhaps the public opinion of the people in Chile is in favor of socialism. So you know, even if they're better off with private uh, water, they might just think, no, no, government should provide it. You know, government should provide this, right? Because uh, public opinion matters, right? Pub the public aren't yeah. always protesting in favor of what it's is called good. democracy, <laughs> and democracy is indeed the god that failed. <laughs> Jaren, did you have something? Yeah, just in terms of privatism of things of necessity, such as water, I'll just use an anecdote. Is you know the the theory behind private property and look you know i'm i'm actually i'm not a communist like them i consider myself an anarchist um but i just kind of tend to go with things that make sense to me and when you look at the world as a whole it is a a static environment in many ways we share the same environment no matter what we do and to sequester necessities and things that cause environmental damage off into quote unquote private property is a bit of an oxymoron because these things do affect everything around them. So my, my anecdotal uh, point that I'm going to make is when Bolsonaro took control of Brazil, um, he forced a bunch of indigenous people off of their lands, decided to use the lands for cattle farming. This is in the Amazon basin. Now, previously during rainfall, um, the basin would soak up all of the excess nitrogen that came from the jungle. And once all of those trees and things were gone, all of that nitrogen flows out into the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean. 
and eventually causes massive algae blooms that I saw myself when I was in Mexico recently um, that just absolutely decimate the wildlife all the way up into the Gulf of Mexico and into the Caribbean islands. So one decision about private property in Brazil from Bolsonaro selling it to private entities under the licenses that it seems both of you approve of, has not only affected Brazil and the people that live there, but it has affected multiple countries, multiple ecosystems, things that we may not be able to bring back, and not to mention the tourist industries and all of these places on which these nations rely. It's, it seems very dangerous to consider that you have infinite right to do what you want with necessities without consequence. So uh, what you've described here is that the government took land from people, you know, not an anarcho-capitalist thing, not, not a capitalist thing at all. The government is interfering in the market, taking land from people and giving it to someone else. And then there was disastrous consequences. This seems like a great argument You're in our favor. Describing capitalism. <laughs> Can I More accurately, not. a private company, <laughs> a private company used the government as a tool yeah, a to do what they company. would have done anyway. This, this to is do what, what they would have done anyway. This is what Ben was talking about army. before. This is what Ben was talking about before. How you you can say this is privatization, but really they're just taking stuff away from people and reallocating it to their favored party members, and it's still monopolized. That's still monopolized. You it's, don't think it's not in the hands of the them. actual owners. It does not. That is the negation of capitalism. I mean, That's government interference in the market. So, if I, follow up if, question. <laughs> if there were no Brazilian government and there were a large private company that wanted that land, you don't think they would just go in and murder everyone and take it? They might, and this would be statism. If I may, I, am, I, I know a lot Ooh. about the subject when... Uh, it, concerning private property and and indigenous people um i've done a lot of research i recently wrote an article um about this so like zulu said i see this as an example of like a, a great example of why letting people have their private property and take care of it um the way they're t they want to take care of it uh, is good like they is native people who know how to take care of their land and then you have other people who come in i think i i say privatize the the amazon i think the amazon's has a major problem with tragedy of the commons and i don't think you would have that problem as much as you privatize amazon and yeah let indigenous people own large swaths of it that's that sounds great to us um but concerning like what you said if there wasn't the government would private companies do this i say no and i think we have uh, a great amount of evidence for this so Maybe Lay it we have on to me. go back, of course. Um, so in America, there is uh, there's a great paper. Uh, it's called a uh, Raid or Trade. The I think it's called Raid or Trade: The Economics of White Indian Relations. Uh, something to that extent. If you search that up, it'll come up, right? So these researchers, um, uh, Terry Anderson and Peter J. Hill, they went back and looked at white Indian conflicts that happened in the Old West before and after you had the standing army right so you had like the you had the civil war you had a uh, war with the spanish various wars so you had times where the the standing army is way over here out east and then now they're over here because it's after the war and they're doing nothing there's no wars going on what they found was there were significantly more white indian conflicts when there was the standing army and that's because the private property owners the individuals private militias whoever it was even if they hated the native americans even if they didn't respect their private property they typically would not raid them, but rather trade with them because it was far more beneficial. They found that if they raided them and took their stuff, then well, now the Native Americans are going to come after us and we're risking our own lives. We have to risk our own capital, even if we're hiring militiamen or something, we have to risk our own capital. But when you had the government military out there, then you could go and raid the Native Americans, take their stuff, come back when the warriors come after you, you go to the military and say, oh, look, you know, they're attacking. Right. And then the military defends you for free or, or, or for taxes, which if it's taxes, then the cost is balanced out among a lot more people. So you're still paying far less. Not only that, but there were very bad incentives. Like there were some people who uh, took over high command positions after the wars because commanders above them died. And they had rules like, oh, if you don't win a battle in the next six months, you get demoted. Ridiculous stuff like that in, in the state military. Um, and I, I, I'm sorry I'm talking a lot, but there's one more great example. Um, Acadia, Nova Scotia, 
1655 to 1755, the Acadians were very anarcho-capitalistic, I would say. Um, they didn't have a state. They rejected the state. They ran on a completely free market. And by the Acadians, you had the Mi'kmaq Indians, who also didn't have a state. Um, they were, I would say they were a little bit more socialistic, anarcho-socialistic. Um, uh, but the, the Acadians, very similarly, they respected the Mi'kmaq's private property rights. They traded with them. They even started intermarrying with them. And this is one of the reasons the British um, eventually went after the Acadians and did the, the expulsion of the Acadians. But so in summary, I would say in anarcho-capitalism, those types of relationships are far more peaceful. Listening to a libertarian debunk himself as much as the next guy, but there's one thing in particular here that I really enjoyed, and that was, you know, we we've asked a few times now about. I think Mike even posed the question of, do, under a capitalist system in Brazil, would those native people have been attacked and had their land taken? And I, th I think you hinted towards no. Zulu hinted towards maybe, and then of course your further discussion right here. I. I think is very important because that really is true. It really is that the only reason they did not attack those Native Americans and take their land and instead traded with them was because in the capitalist model, they do not respect property rights. They do not respect any rights of any others. It comes down to dollars. And just as you explained, they crunched their numbers and it was not profitable to attack them for their losses to their work working labor to you know their their potential income they decided it was more profitable to quote unquote respect their treaties and respect their rights and trade with them than to do otherwise and that really is all capitalism is and i would also kind of just like to to tack on to sterling's point real quick um i have a very different understanding of relations among like white settlers and <laughs> and natives in America than you guys may. And I don't know, maybe it could just be media bias, but like the way I understand it is like even the origins of libertarian ideology itself are rooted in this time period. And literally the government would tell white settlers that they could go onto Indian lands and just kind of kill Indians with impunity. And they would allow them to do that because it benefited them. And then a lot of times what would happen is these settlers would go onto a land, like an area, and then get attacked by the Indians for, like, really just trespassing, like, you know, even basic property rights. Um, and then this would be used to garner a lot of sympathy and fervor to, like, go out and massacre a bunch of natives. And so, like, this was, like, how libertarian and the idea of, like, the rugged individualist settler even began, that a whole lot of Americans are, like, basing their ideology on today. Uh, but I wanted to see what you had, Jaron, and then Ben had something, so we can go back to him. So one is comparing something from, you know, the 17, 16, 15, 1400s to nowadays, assuming that the Amazon, Amazonian natives would have the same armaments as a multinational uh, meat corporation that wants to farm cattle on their land. It wouldn't matter if they tried to defend themselves. There's, there's no reason by way of force that it would discourage a multinational corporation from destroying an Amazonian tribe there's no way they could come back and make it less profitable for that corporation to just murder them. But building off of Mike's point, um, yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at 1776 as the, the formative event of American history, that's false also. Um, the proclamation of 1768 is more apt, and that's where the King of England at the time said, you can't go past the Ohio Valley and create settlements which really pissed off a bunch of white landowning colonists that happened to have primary uh, industries throughout the colonies. They wanted to go into the Ohio Valley. They wanted to go across Appalachia. Um, and that, that impetus of privatization, of, of moving their industry westward into French territory or formerly French territory and into uh, native territory, that was the seminal event of creating the United States. It was based off of privatization, based off of what I guess you could call libertarianism. Um, and that was about pushing people off of their land. The government formed, the government of the United States formed kind of as an afterthought to facilitate this. Um, and if you do look at the, the proclamation of 1768, it, it pissed off the colonists so bad because they were like, well, if we're fighting, but we can't go west and take more then what are we fighting for kind of mentality. 
the thing about about global capitalism as an emerged, I'm not talking about like the kind that came from the fourth estate after the French Revolution. I'm talking about the the kind that we see in global markets now emerged strictly in my mind from uh, American Protestantism and from westward expansion and manifest destiny. So therefore, yeah, it is in many ways inseparable from the same racism and entitlement that that came from it. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> on what Sterling said, I would say that's a bit of a misrepresentation. I don't know if you can still hear me. I don't want to. I don't want to answer his thing while he's not here. <laughs> um, Might be brave. Okay. I, well, I'll talk to to Jaren then. Um, yeah. But, I mean, it, it, like I can see. I can see. You said you were an anarchist. I can see like you've got these very uh, anarchist tendencies, and I'll, I'm I'm agreeing with you a lot <clears throat> when you're talking. But I I still think it definitely like there was this big disconnection between the people who actually respected private property and then the government. And you know, there's plenty of people. Like I said, there's plenty of people who didn't respect private property and people who were willing, somewhat willing to use violence. But it was always more favorable for them to have a state backing them. And um, uh, can you hear me, Sterling? Oh, there it goes. Okay. Yeah, so for, for what Sterling said, like I said, I think it's a bit of a misrepresentation of what I was saying. I was kind of being a bit hyperbolic, like pointing out, like even under the worst circumstances, let's let's assume the worst, like they're racist, maybe don't see them as humans, definitely don't respect the private property rights. There's no reason for them to respect them in any way or them to trade with them other than they can benefit from it, right? I'm, I'm, I'm doing that on purpose, assuming that. I don't think everybody thought that way. And I don't think that's like, you know, what, what, we're, what we're fighting for, right? But the thing is, even if you have those most terrible people and they're forced to be in these trading relationships... What that does is it helps them realize, like, as I'm trading with these people, I realize they have similar goals as me. They have similar wants as me. These are people. These are human beings. And I'm trading with them as human beings. You don't do that with animals. You don't do that with anything subhuman. I think that really helps that problem, right? Because, I mean, of course, you know, the further back you go, the more racist people are, generally speaking. Um, you know, people had that, you know, you had science advancing, you had these most people, they never met anybody of a different race in their life. And, you know, as you are introducing these relationships and it's shocking people, you know, a lot of, a lot of reasons there was more racism in the past. I think these types of relationships genuinely make that better. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's all I have to say. Uh, Jaren, did you have anything again? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I put the award. sources in the uh, Gulag hard labor chat. If anyone wants to, look <laughs> I think you have the right rules to post in this. Like, <laughs> I was giving. Okay, so just for clarification, I've been giving a lot of people uh, that role because it like limits what they can see in the server, and I just don't know like what people have posted in what channels in the server that may like reveal personal identi identity or info about them. So I just am like limiting people. But yeah, the, yeah. the role I gave you guys was called Gulag hard labor. Sorry about that. Yeah, there's um, there's definitely some uh, intense anticipation of this leading up and some of our comrades in the uh chat may have said some pretty mean things so i don't think it's i even nice have the gulag hard labor channel no you just have the podcast role and i think you okay. should have that as well otherwise you wouldn't even be able to be in this channel but i don't know I, that doesn't matter um no. i did want to address a couple things like oh but before i do sorry ward that's what i want to say you had your hand up my bad. Yeah, um, like, we keep making these references, like, much of the tune that Mike was, like, saying earlier, like, how we have to reference this, like, hypothetical situation, much of the tune that we're referencing, like, your study, uh, which I'm not going to even try to work on that. I'm just going to say that, like, if we're talking about Brazil and indigenous tribes and private industries, like, there's a long history of private industries hiring mercenaries and killing indigenous tribes. Hey. <laughs> yeah, so um I can actually well, help word on that one is uh the so basically the the Catholic Church way back in the day um which was not affiliated necessarily with the government but Portugal wanted to take control of Brazil for the sugar trade and the Catholic Church basically said like yeah, you have you have God's license to do that. Um 
And it, it really was not necessarily correlated with government. It was correlated with the fact that like colonists found sugar in Brazil and a bunch of private companies were like, yeah, we would like to have that. And that's really one of the first instances of like Western colonization that happened. But Ward, keep going. I didn't mean to take that. Yeah, no, sorry about that. Um, but no, no, like there's a serious history of private industries hiring mercenaries and killing indigenous tribes to get access to their land. So much so that Brazil had to make laws against such a thing. And it's still happening. Private companies are still hiring mercenaries to kill indigenous tribes. These uncontacted tribes have been wiped out from private industries. So, like, I don't know why we're making references to something else when we can talk about the actual situation. Uh, I would just like to, you know, quickly interject here that, like, you know, you guys love wax waxing poetic about how uh, you know the natives have had their rights violated and whatnot but you guys haven't actually put forth a theory of what it means to have your rights violated we have uh we've given you like the conflict the avoidance theory of property rights where if you're initiating conflict then you're violating someone's rights so we've given you that basis but what do you guys mean when you say rights are being violated I don't think we're disagreeing with you about the rights of like land ownership or whatever. Like I still I know would you disagree are. with like owning land. Uh, but I'm saying even by your own definition that you guys are putting forward, then these people are having the rights violated. It's not that we have to put the definition forward. Okay, by your right. Definition. Yeah. But I would I say mean, that I literally you, just you... listened to an example where people are being murdered. That's all. Yeah. Shouldn't yeah. Yeah. Have to... but, but you have, you absolutely are disagreeing with our definition because you said that owning property itself is an initiation conflict, which is absolutely false. You're saying that owning property, keeping people away from property, that is violating someone's rights. But why okay, so, is this violating someone's rights? So earlier, I mentioned that book that I called the hippie book, the Ishmael book, and then the sequel, the story of B. The reason I even brought it up and I never got to the point was because they give a definition that I think kind of works. And I don't think it's a Marxist definition, but it was cool. And it's like a very good layman's explanation. But they said that in nature, obviously animals kill each other and then humans naturally do farm and like have agriculture and everything. And so the definition that they arrived at, you know, this author or whatever, was that you can you can do what you need to do for survival, but you cannot wage war. And that when you wage war, you are taking more than you need. And like, so the example would be like enclosing huge swaths of land that is more than you could ever use for yourself personally. And, you know, hoarding resources or just killing wantonly, like killing other animals because, you know, when it applies to predators, like animals that need to eat other animals or whatever, when it goes beyond killing what you need to eat and just killing indiscriminately, you know, you know I think I'm getting the point across. But that's the definition that they use. And I think you could make a sort of similar analogy with Marxism. And I think that, you know, when it gets to what we would advocate, it would be like, I think all of us Marxists advocate for people still having personal property. And just not private property. And we've we've gone into that st distinction a bunch. I'm assuming you guys are probably familiar with that as well. But I want to see what uh, Sterling had. I just really quickly wanted to put this out here. It's a, a little random. But just kind of one key difference between, say, capitalism and Marxist, Marxism-Leninism. I'm sure you guys have heard people say Marxism-Leninism, Jesus Christ, is a science. They call it the immortal science of Marxism-Leninism. I'm not sure if you know why that term's used, but to compare it to something like capitalism, capitalism is more of a blueprint. It's more of a, here's how you do it, and if you do it wrong, then it's not really capitalism. And it's like, all, all the things we're describing are the flaws of capitalism. It's just constantly, oh, well, that really wasn't capitalism. Even sometimes going as far to call it socialism. Whereas Marxism-Leninism is a science, and every time that communism happened, besides perhaps uh, Pol Pot, that was real communism. There's never a, a situation where you you kind of give us like a downside of it and we say, oh, well, that was because of X, Y, Z. That, was, that wasn't communism. It was absolutely communism, but that's the difference between capitalism and that, which I don't consider ideology, I consider it a science, Marxism-Leninism, is the fact that you do take uh, study, education, history into account, and Marxism-Leninism is constantly evolving. What what most people consider Marxism-Leninism today is very different from even just a few decades ago, whereas capitalism has very, very little changes have happened at all. Um, I would just like to continue the discussion of, like, 
Uh, right, so um, Mike gave the definition of what the rights are as, okay, if you're taking more than you need to literally just survive, like, you know, if you're going above bare subsistence, then you're violating rights. But I would ponder what exactly the derivation, what the proof of this theory of rights is, because we have a proof in argumentation ethics. We have our proof. What is your proof? Go ahead, Jaron. I'm, I'm trying to parse what you mean by a proof. You know, I, I, I was just writing something the other day for fun, and I, I have a problem with the idea of inherent rights. I, I don't think that we are born free. I think that we are born into various stages of slavery to our own mortality and our own condition. I think that if you are hungry and you cannot eat, you are not free. I think if you are thirsty, you cannot drink, you are not free. If you are homeless, you are not free. If you have a medical condition and you can't obtain help for that, you're not free. We're born into various stages of our own needs, and that is an original slavery. I think that the idea that we are free by virtue of just coming into this mortal coil, no one can find the answer for it because it doesn't exist. Now, that being said, I think that freedom is something that we can assure to each other. And I think that to Ben's point, sometimes, yes, mutual aid is something that we can use to do this. And I think that, obviously, as an anarchist, I support the shit out of mutual aid and I partake in it and I think that everyone's formative uh, baseline personality should should work towards that but at the same time I also think that overarching systems that facilitate these these escapes from our original slavery are important as well and that is part of where like I do break ideologically with some anarchists is you know in in the ways of like David Graeber or Saul Newman, I believe that the incarnations that we've seen of the state, the modern state, these are all experiments and they're relatively new ones. And I disagree with the idea that the state is inherently bad because I don't think that we have determined enough of the science behind the state to automatically assume that it can't be used for some sort of mutual aid. Correct. And to that effect, I do believe that there are there are intersections of leftism where we can assure these things to each other where yeah, if you're hungry and you're you're a slave to that hunger, hunger you should be fed. Um I believe that we entitle these things to each other. There is no not you are not born with a goddamn thing that doesn't come from somebody else. Um so, without, uh, if you said there that you have a problem with the idea of inherent rights, you don't think there are actually inherent rights, but would you uh, say it's some sort of rights violation uh, for me to go off and bomb the local orphanage or something? What, what are you getting at with that question? I'm getting at whether or not you think rights are a thing. So, would that be a rights I violation for me to bomb? I think that ethically that would be really messed up, but I don't think that you using the right to bomb an orphanage is the same as people having the right to water in their own geographic area. That's a but terrible would, comparison. Would, would, me, would me wanting to go ahead and bomb an orphanage, would that justify someone else stopping me? Would someone else be just in stopping me from bombing that orphanage? Sure. Okay, so then they have a right to stop me from bombing the orphanage. I don't have the right to bomb that orphanage. Right, and you also don't have the right That's to an inherent enclose, right. say, a water source that everyone needs. Why not? <laughs> because it would be killing them just like you bombing the orphanage. Okay, so, so would the... Like what, what, if we can go back <laughs> to the analogy from earlier. Would, uh, if, let's just say, uh, none of the women want to have sex with me, I'll die in a week if I don't have sex. Uh, would they be it's killing me in the same balls. way? You're using blue balls as a defense. <sighs> would they? Would they be killing me in that same way? Would they? Would I have a right to force them into sex? Well, buddy, I'm a proponent of of supporting sex workers. So just no, no, no. Would, be, none of them want be... to. None of them want to even. None of them even for money. Jesus even for Christ. all the money in the world, okay. they don't want to have I'm sex with to... me. Would I be allowed to force them to have sex with me? No. No. Why not though? <laughs> Because otherwise they're because killing that's me. That's fucked up, dude. Right, yeah, but on like, what grounds? Because otherwise they're killing me. So you're basically right? equating capitalism to rape and defending it. No, no, I'm equating his position to rape. That's what I'm doing. No, you're not. 
I absolutely no, am. Like, I, this is very easy to follow. I wrote down a couple. Can I, I just say one last thing just for, for Zulu here? Yeah, please. Your situation that you're describing where you're going to die if you don't have sex <laughs> is hypothetical, and that has never been a, co a confirmed medical condition. Irrelevant. What I am describing is people needing food, water, things that are literally in this world. What, so making what some is the whack hypothetical thing that you're coming up you with know what analogies is are. so detached from reality. I'm talking I'm about aware. simple shit, dude. A I'm move, aware it's detached from water, reality. Food. It's yeah. to test your That's ethics. Kind of, I, I would like to... We're halfway through. We're now at 6 p.m. We're going to end at 7, I assume. So I would like to... I wrote down a couple things in the first half, and I would like to not let them go because there are things that I think really need some addressing. Um, the first I put down was the idea of the governments doing genocide on Native Americans being socialism. Like, just governments, you know, that being a socialist enterprise uh, because it was done by a government. Um, I, I put down the libertarian origins, but I addressed that already. Um, I had started this whole thing off. I wanted to talk about Hoppe, Hans Hermann Hoppe, because I saw a practice Ben that that's in your bio and you're like reading him. So I do want to ask you about your thoughts on him. Um, I also want to ask you guys at some point, I'm, I'm listing all of these because I want to see like what pricks everybody's ears up and what people want to tackle first. I want to ask you guys about historical or current examples of successful free market capitalism. Um, and then, or if there haven't been any that you guys would support how we could get there from the current state. And also, um, I would ask you guys to have a response to like my, my position that the, that U S that the U S is the only reason that global capitalism is even possible. Like the U S and it's glow spanning empire and it's 800 military bases is the only reason that there is such a thing as global 900. Capitalism. Thank you, buddy. Um, and that's the only reason that that is possible. And I would love to see if you guys have a response to, to that. And then, Oh, and then I, I, the last thing I wrote here was the abstract analogies. Um, so, like I said, the original thing that got you guys here was me posting on Reddit to get people to come defend capitalism. And so what I'm doing with all these debate things is kind of like, I, I said it on at the end of like one of our other debates. It's like we had this debate with other libertarians or ANCAPs, and they had to keep always going back to like these, I don't know, like Econ 101, like textbook analogies and like hypothetical situations. And I think that that is a really big point for us. Like, I think that the fact that you guys have to like describe all these hypothetical scenarios and can't talk about capitalism in the real world, helping people or like capitalist solutions to the problems that they're having. Um, yeah, I think that's great because my whole position is that we are now in like the reverse of where we were 30 years ago, where people were like, oh, that wasn't real socialism. Oh, that wasn't real communism. And now everybody's like, oh, that's not real capitalism. I think that's what <laughs> you guys have to do all the time because capitalism is morally indefensible and so everything has to be oh that's actually like every time you know a government does something even if it's in the interest of businesses uh it's it's socialism somehow which is it's funny to me but i'll let you guys respond to any of those things um any of those points you guys want to talk about i'm down to be honest with you it would be really great if in our second half of this we could yeah. talk more about socialism and communism because um, me and like you did say to be fair you did say you want people on here defending capitalism but me and zulu have been on the defense basically the whole time it would be great to talk a little bit more about you guys system but i you did ask some fair questions here so i mean we we could address some of that real quick now of course um first of all as as i noticed you know you know zulu's talking about ethics and i know most of you guys are marxist leninist you're very materialist deterministic so there I, I see there's definitely a disconnection there right and i think i think it's important to for both sides to consider that right we're obviously approaching things from a very different like that's fundamentally different from a metaphysical uh metaphysical perspective right we're, we're idealist you know we're not materialist we're not deterministic um but you know also libertarianism and defenses of capitalism are a lot more broad you know we have theories of history and class theories and all that stuff which you know i would love to get into sometime i don't think we'd have time to get into it today if anyone wants to read some of that you can hit me up but um i mean the importance of hypotheticals is if you're talking about if you're if you're trying to like moralize something and say something is just something is unjust you should be consistent right because if you're inconsistent you must necessarily be wrong somewhere and it's good to be right. It's not good to be wrong. And, you know, like when Zulu brings up these examples, he's just showing like, I mean, why would you say this in this situation, but say something completely different in another situation? And he's also showing you guys how we see things. Because, you know, from we see, someone mentioned body autonomy earlier. We see body autonomy or self-ownership, as we call it, as, you know, fundamental right 
and then things like private property come from that. So yeah, we do see it as very similar for that reason. And we see the justifications for owning your body as pretty similar to the justifications of owning private property. But uh, Zulu might have some things to say. But like I said, I would really love to talk a little bit more about um, your guys' positions. What are your thoughts on abortion, then, if, if you believe in bodily autonomy? I'm an evictionist. What does that mean? Ah, there you go. You didn't expect that one. Uh, basically, I, you're right. I, I think it's uh, just to uh, evict the fetus, but not to kill them, right? Because I think the fetus, they are a baby. Ow. They are. They, you can't go ahead and write, write off just, you know, throw a pill down your throat, which dissolves them, right? But you are allowed to remove them from you into an artificial womb or whatever. That's completely just, right? Even if they would die outside of your body, you're still allowed to remove them. The mother is not obligated to support the fetus. And I know a while back, Prax that Ben. A, that's was, abortion. <laughs> it's it's not abortion. I know a while back, Prax Ben at least was a departureist. He might be an evictionist now. I don't know, so I won't speak for him. But at least I either. am an evictionist. Wait, do do these artificial wombs exist? Is that a thing? Yes, they do. You uh, certainly, we need to get to, these babies we, to pay some fucking rent or else. We, <laughs> People, people, we use artificial wombs all the time for uh, livestock. They are in common use for livestock, but the state bans their use for humans. Right? This guy's trying to create the Matrix. Jesus. <laughs> uh, it's just, right? There is no, no argument just, against it being around. just. I I mean, that's fascinating. That a brand new take I've never heard. Yeah. That is fascinating. <laughs> I kind of like it. I mean, so my stance on abortion has always been like, yeah, sure. It may even be murder, but like it's probably better off to, you know, end a, like terminate a pregnancy than bring a child into a world where it's like unwanted or unable to be cared for adequately. So well, like, that's a terrible or argument. Or capitalist. <laughs> you know, right? We can go back to the bombing of the orphanage. You know, it, there might be a bunch of children who nobody wants to take care of. That doesn't mean I can go out and kill them. Yeah, but they're like already alive and have experience. So is the baby. So is the baby inside yeah, the womb. Really it's know. already alive. Remember the womb? I sure don't. <laughs> Maybe just because I don't, have just because I don't remember right it, now. you know. If no, I was really, if I have, if I have, if I have retrograde amnesia or whatever it is, I won't remember <laughs> anything. Just because I won't remember it doesn't mean I don't have rights. Yeah, I don't. I just don't think the fetus is a person. Anymore. It doesn't have retrograde but why, amnesia. But why, is it, sure. why is it not a person though? Why is it not a person? Where is the because point it of person? Cannot dude? survive outside of its host body. <laughs> There's there, That's why. there a are child, a, no 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 no. There are a, a lot child of people. In an orphanage yeah, really is walking around. It can digest. Oh whoa whoa! whoa. Not if they are not if they are cord. severely disabled. If they are severely disabled in a vegetative state, they might require other people's help to keep them alive. What about that child? What? Let, what, let me just they, let me just say this: so what Jaren's describing are systems and facilities that are already established where we can actually do what Jaren's describing. We do not have. I mean, obviously they're using it on cows, as you've described. But if we had a hundred thousand women this year who wanted to do what you're saying, there's no way in hell we have the hospitals to also, support like, that. We, we can't. Right. In I don't libertarian think society, that. insurance would not cover this. I would love to see how that works. If it doesn't cover it, then it doesn't cover it. So, uh, didums. So we right? gotta kill the baby, then. If, <laughs> no, no, no. We don't have to kill the baby. If the baby has no adopters who are able to care for it, then it will die. Yes. That sometimes happens. But it's just, right? But you're not... It's not just to just assume that nobody is willing to take on the costs of keeping this child alive okay, and then so, killing no, it mean, right just, off the bat. That, that is I not just. Like this because this is, this is hilarious to me because it seems like the libertarian and ANCAP solution to abortion is to delay the abortion nine months by putting the fetuses into these crazy energy-intensive facilities that we definitely don't have and aren't approved for human use. And basically... Like, aren't approved by the, the state. Matrix. And then... And then, well, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll grant them. That's fine, um, but like, yeah, create kind of the matrix for a whole bunch of wombs, and then then let them die after like nine months when they don't get adopted because there's already alive people who aren't being adopted. It's like, but the the reason why there's alive people currently not being adopted is because adoption is socialized. We don't have a market for babies. We need a market for babies. Oh no. <laughs> okay. Okay, I mean, so this is I like, don't even know what to say to that. This is what I love. I love when you guys come on here and give these takes because, like, holy shit. Like, I love when people go mask off and say we need a market for human beings. That's, like, that's cool. <laughs> I'll be clear, right? That is basically, I'm... Uh, oh, so you missed it. He said we need a market I, for babies. That was yeah, the yeah, yeah. crisis. Yeah, I'm basically, um, 
I'm parodying a Rothbard uh, quote from Ethics of Liberty, where he says there needs to be a market in children and this will solve his stuff. Basically, what is meant by that is that, well, guardianship well, is I know scarce. It's meant. No, no, no. What, guardianship is scarce. You're not actually owning the child. You're owning the guardianship role over them. <laughs> so this can be transferred between people. And because it's not allowed to be transferred between people, that's why we have these problems. And I've got another hot take for you guys. Didn't, didn't uh, organ, organ you sales. have no obligation to take care of your child? I'm yeah, he was wrong. This. He was wrong. Uh, he was definitely wrong. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> hey, we can agree on some things. Good. Yeah, but like, Rothbard's pro-choice view Rothbard is completely wrong, but Rothbard's pro-choice view, that is directly implied that you're allowed to neglect a child. If pro-choice is correct, then yeah, you are allowed to neglect a child completely and forestall them yeah, to you're, adopters. Yeah, you're not. You're not because CPS will come in and take care of you. <laughs> but if pro-choice is <laughs> That's correct... Socialism! If, socialism, if, Jerry! <laughs> if the pro-choice ethic is correct, then CPS stopping people from neg neglecting children are engaged in crime. If the pro-choice e ethic is correct, I don't if think I it is correct. A fetus, if I thought a fetus was the same as a six-year-old, I would agree with you, but yeah. I don't. What's the distinction? What's the I distinction also think we're a fetus and six-year-old. I I Being also think or not, dude. Like I, I think we're also neglecting. Birth is a change Praxman. of location. We're, we're we're ignoring Praxman, and he looks like he's gonna have a meltdown. So I want to make gun. sure. <laughs> oh, I want to make know, sure he's getting tired. There's a there's been a few times he's got missed. I just want to make sure we're not stepping on him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I feel like I feel like this could be talk. I mean, first of all, we shouldn't even be talking about this. No, I didn't that, want to no, do this. I, we shouldn't even be talking about this. It's well, hilarious. Nobody, I'm loving it. Nobody was like, "Oh, we're going to be freaking debating about abortion." <laughs> okay, what you but, okay. Personally, I don't like. I don't think the evictionism position holds up. I'm not going to sit here and give my critique. Maybe I'll debate Zulu on it sometime. Personally, I'm pro life. Is. And I do think it is consistent with libertarian ethics, but like hearing a, an evictionist and pro choice pro choicers debate is like so painful to me because, <laughs> like, I'm. Uh, it's like we were going to debate that at some point. Everything. We we planned the <laughs> we debate. We, we can still do ages it. ago, ages ago. <clears throat> but I mean, Whew. like I mean, when you know when Zulu's talking about like a market for babies or children. all he's <laughs> talking about is adoption you know like we are it, technically it is a market it's adoption so if you're like oh no that, that that's terrible you know having a you would want to ban adoption so i mean it's, i it's about I, optics you shouldn't say a market for babies it's funny though stupid uh, well, some, well, <laughs> some, well, some babies cost more than others. Is there, is there going to be like a grading yeah, if, scale? Like that's a, that's a gender, premium baby. <laughs> gen, they, you would expect there, they would expect there to be like, you know, if there's like a disabled baby who can't walk, it's probably going to be cheaper than like a super athlete baby. Someone who's going to grow up to be like Michael Jordan times 10, right? That's going to be more expensive. Yeah. Probably won't be basketball they're looking to put them into, but yeah. We we should probably move What's on. Yeah, like, like, can we talk about anything else? So let me let me read Sorry. The, uh, the things that I mentioned. Can anyone? Because I will give a take on it, but I still want to address the idea of the U.S. government genociding Native Americans being socialism. Jaron, did you want to say anything about that? Because if not, I would love to. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, I just think that like that is inherently capitalism. Like it was done in the interest of taking property from people and taking resources from people. And then it was used to generate profit to build up the U S and that is what the U S is built up on is imperialism and genocide. And it's the only reason, like I said, that global capitalism has been able to thrive because there is the empire backing it up. And what I usually do is ask people to describe to me a time historically or current where a free market has been able to do any of the things that they claim it can do without some kind of military or government backing it up. And Kidia. the best example I've gotten so far has been like some tribes in Iceland, like 400 or so. I don't, I don't even know how many hundreds of years ago. Um, and it's not the first time. Like Sterling and I got that example when we did our second debate. And I also, I'll recommend another book that I, <laughs> that literally got me to be a cringe libertarian for like a year or two when I was in my early 20s, which is this book, Foreign Emergent Governance by Ryan Falk. And it's like, it's so crazy, but it like, it's an entertaining read. It's pretty short, but uh, yeah, even like their solution for like any of this stuff, like it basically is just the case that like you guys, again, have to like say that everything bad that's done by a government, again, even if it's in the name of business interest and taking property and, you know, making money, 
is socialism. And I find that just really, really funny because socialists want to use government to protect indigenous people, to protect marginalized people. Like that is literally our goal for all of this. And I don't know. I mean, I do want to get into at some point, some, some talk about concept, our conceptions of like rights and power, because I do think that we don't have any inherent rights beyond what we are able to defend. Like if you want to claim an area and make a socialist state, then you have to be able to defend it with some force when you get attacked inevitably. And so that's why I'm like an authoritarian Marxist as opposed to like a libertarian, you know, anarcho-communist or something who thinks that we're going to be able to just like organize some horizontal defenses. It's like, yeah, I, I, that's another distinction that I would make that I also think ties into like the, like, uh, what do you call it? Like the indigenous genocide thing. Like I think the U.S. had to, again, genocide these people to take their land. It was a capitalist venture. And that's what capitalism has always and will always depend on. But sorry, I'm getting okay, sidetracked right. and like I, rambling. I, I have some points to respond with there. Basically, uh, you know, you will recall at the start of this debate, Prax Ben, uh, he defines socialism as infringements on property rights, right? Any sort of system of infringement on property rights. That was his definition of socialism, paraphrasing, right? And then you're saying, well, this is clearly socialism because, you know, they were infringing on these property rights and reallocating them elsewhere. That's that's clearly not socialism. That's capitalism. It's like, no, 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 no. Capitalism is the unhampered market. It's the lack of that. But also, uh, you just, uh, at the end there, you said that rights are what you can defend. Well, if rights are what you can defend, then rights are meaningless, right? Then the natives didn't have rights because they weren't able to defend themselves, if if a man walks down an alley and stabs a person, then he didn't have the right to not be stabbed because he couldn't defend himself. It's completely pointless. It's meaningless. It has no, no it's not, philosophical it's not backing. It's just, like, it's just kinda what I would call a material condition. And like that's the whole thing about like when I say that libertarians are like, you know, it's usually libertarians, but it's like just the right wingers in generally generally they venerate the constitution and the idea of like the rights of man or I don't know, whatever. And it's just annoying to me because I just don't think that they really mean anything in practice because you see like the contradictions in your daily life. You see how these actually get applied in practice. And I don't know. I just don't think that anyone is under the illusion that our government works democratically or for people. It works for businesses. And that is capitalism. And I just it's not. I know. I know you have to say that. This is, this is, no, but this is not what guys, we believe like, in. Cool. We are an, we are anarchists. But Both of us are anarchists. That's, well, that's, again, We're against the state. Give me the example where your thing your system has worked because i, I can give you iceland uh prax ben can give you uh wild west and acadia right we we can give you these yeah, examples but how do we get Kaspaya. back there from here like how we get there from here it well that's you know basically ancap praxis are we agreed that because what the praxis is is kind of irrelevant to whether it's true whether anarcho-capitalism is true it is completely relevant as to whether we can ever get there. Ace Arcist actually had a tweet about this earlier today where, well, anarcho-capitalism is, well, it's not just to initiate uh, a conflict with someone, right? That is just, that is what anarcho-capitalism is. It's the NAP. So if you agree that it's not just to initiate conflict against someone, then that's you're an anarcho-capitalist. Where do you think it's possible for, you know, some wizard to come along and wave his magic wand so that nobody ever aggresses ever? It's irrelevant to whether it's correct that it's not just to aggress against someone. It is correct that it's not just to aggress against someone. And if we want to move closer towards that ideal, then we can start talking about that. But what's the point of doing that? If you guys don't even agree that it's not just to aggress against someone, what's the point? No, I agree that it's not just. I just think that it still happens. And I don't think you it's... do agree that it's not just, though. I don't think you do. No, no, I agree that it's not just. I just think that it's like that's what I'm saying. It still happens. A lot of unjust things happen all the time. And what it comes down to is whether you're able to prevent it from happening or then able to like hold people responsible when they do aggress on other people. And that's <laughs> where the state comes in. Because if, whoa, whoa, just, whoa, that's where the state comes in. You you said it's not just to aggress against people. The state is right. aggressing against people, so the state shouldn't exist. We should have this anarcho-capitalist utopia. So, like, well, are you conceding the well, ANCAP point? Don't, like, I don't think there's anything necessarily, like, inherent about a state oh, there that is. aggresses against people. Well, the, I mean, the, the American state, for sure. But the, I think no, the state necessarily state. is a reallocation of property 
away from where it should be, away from its true owners. You don't think that there could be such a thing as a voluntary state? No, never. I disagree, but I, I, everybody's got their hands up. What, are Let's you like just... uh, Randian? Uh, no. I think on. Sterling anyway. was first. Okay, Sterling, and then Ward, and then Jaren. Yeah, mine is quick. Um, So, a- again, with these straw man arguments and just loose comparisons like you started by using Praxbin's explanation of socialism using a complete straw man definition that that is not what stra- what socialism is that is a straw man argument of what socialism is socialism is not the infringement on private property yes there is no private property under communism and socialism is the transition towards that but that is you you can't define an entire ideology to this is an infringement on private property because socialism is a hell of a lot more than that. Just as I would not say capitalism is infringement on everything good in the world, though I could say that it, it would be a straw man argument. And when Mike was explaining that under a socialist system, you have to be able to defend yourself against outside invaders. That's one thing of a lot of socialist countries have had to do. That's what the Soviet Union had to do. They had to focus on military strength because there were still nations, including the U.S., trying to invade Russia after the revolution. The U.S. did this, and they tried to reinstall the czars. These were things they were trying to do to a socialist country. And your argument was, well, what if somebody comes at me in an alley with a knife? And my question would be, how much have you studied the uh, crime history under the Soviet Union? Especially after like the 1936 Constitution. You probably haven't because there's not a lot of documents out there because it is immeasurable compared to U.S. I mean, it's microscopic. There are there is such a tremendous difference because crime and especially violent crime. And some people are just natured some ways, but for the majority, crime and violent crime, especially our reactions to material conditions. When you meet material conditions, crime decreases, as it did in the Soviet Union, as it is done in practically every socialist experiment in history. So the main reason is because they actually, not only are their material conditions met, they do have a defense that capitalism doesn't have. Socialist countries have the defense of we. they actually prosecute and punish those who break the law. Capitalists don't. Capitalists punish poor people. They, in fact, design laws and entire systems to punish poor people. I don't see too many people getting drug out of Wall Street these days. I mean, it's it's all someone sitting on a corner smoking a joint. The way that we prosecute and handle crime in this country is unreal, and I would think even libertarians agreed with that. I mean, I don't think you guys think drugs, especially marijuana, should be you know punishable by by a crime, especially if I'm not bringing it in from another country and selling it. Um, I would just point out real quick that you keep talking about us strawmanning, but then you say that well, the U.S. is this capitalist thing, but we're that is not. If that is what capitalism is to you, it's not what it is to us, right? We are not in favor of the U.S. But Give I'll me let, an example. I'll let Ben speak. What, what capitalist country are you referring to? Yeah, I mean, this is why I said, like, obviously we're going to disagree on definitions. I mean, it, it's just insane that a Marxist Leninist should have a monopoly on the definition of socialism when socialism far, far precedes Marxist Leninism. I, mean, I was just saying it's more, Marx. I was just saying it was more broad than what you described. That was yeah, I mean, well, the, the thing is, like, when you look at socialists throughout history, whether it be the utopian socialist or the market socialist or whatever, that what holds constant is they want a systematic abolition or extreme restriction of private property and private property exchanges. That is what holds constant every single time, no matter what. They'll change their their metaphysics, their ideology, everything except for that. That holds constant with all socialists with no exceptions. Did Ward go? Yeah. No, I haven't gone. <laughs> Please go. <laughs> Ward go. Okay. Um, and I know Sterling, I love you, but like yeah. when you started doubting me on like being the tankiest tank on this podcast, the this tankiest. is where I'm gonna fucking separate between you and me. Is <laughs> I see the state as a state tool used to oppress one class by the other. In capitalism, it's owned by the owning class, the employer class. 
I think it's fucking sweet when the working class, the masses of people who have been exploited and murdered by private interests, such as examples I brought up earlier, um, take the means of production and state power and oppress those who were oppressing them before. Sorry, I, sorry, I doubt I think it. That's you. fucking sweet. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm not gonna like try to play nice about it. Like I'm just gonna give you like the real like straightforward answer from like a fucking tanky, like for lack of better terms in modern day. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's that's Lenin. I, I, I mean, state I, and revolution. I, you know, the, right. the state actually, I think it means he's interested in tanks. <laughs> I also think <laughs> tanks are cool. So. Zulu, I appreciate you. I just think they're neat. I um, I think they're neat. Yeah, like they're just, fucking uh, sick. I'm getting Jaron. I'm gonna let you go. Yeah. What I do, honestly, I think Lenin was right. The state exists, and so far as classes exist, but the classes is between the, the state class and the other. So, uh. yeah, I think that's a funny conception of it, and I think that's mostly born out of like rhetoric that was created by a bunch of wealthy business owners to get a bunch of poor people on their side yep. and think that like government and regulation means no freedom. And that, like, freedom is being able to, like, starve under privatized resources and stuff, which is, it's just hilarious to me. Because, like, again, this whole thing is to try and get, like, right-wingers to go mask off about what they actually believe and, like, defend some horrendous things. Because what we defend is, like, I don't know, taking a bunch of rich, rich people's stuff and, like, doing some Robin Hood shit, basically, at the most base level. And that's why I think you guys always have to say, like, socialism is about taking, pro like, not respecting people's property rights and you know redistributing stuff it's like you have to do it in the abstract because if you actually talk about it in practice people fucking love it like people love the idea of redistributing some stuff that people are hoarding and like you know guillotining some rich people like that is very popular and i think that again it always has to go back to these like econ 101 like analogies i know you guys have your hands up but i promise i'll go with jaron so we'll do jaron then ward and then we'll go with ben again you can go to ben first he's he's okay. been steamrolled <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, this is this is fine too, right? Like I said at the beginning, I'm more into the economic history set of things. So if you're like, oh no, you can't going back to basic economics. The fact of the matter is, socialism has never been good for poor people. Capitalism has consistently been good for poor people. I don't think I generally don't think you guys can give me a single example Facts. where Facts. socialism performs better <laughs> All right, than capitalism. Your turn, and I'll throw that out there. If you want to give me some example, Go over ahead. 800 million lifted out of absolute poverty in China. How? Socialism. <laughs> socialism. Like the what whole thing we're debating. Socialism with Chinese characteristics. So what if we want to get real specific, I I don't know if you've done the research. Sure, like I can sure. get okay. in the okay. so, so what you're talking about is eight hundred million people lifted out of the World Bank's definition of global extreme poverty, which of course applying the world definition of extreme poverty is you don't do that to one country that literally defeats the point right that's why you have you have poverty by country like you have u.s poverty and then you have world poverty which is meant to generalize everything right it's 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 not super useful but it kind of it gives us something right applying the world extreme poverty level to one country is ridiculous i think but not only that but of course Deng xiaoping he went out of his way to implement liberalization policies specifically they had economic zones stuff like that they recognized that they had to utilize things like private property and that's i i think that's an important part of marxism i think it's ridiculous i think it's insane for a marxist to sit here and say oh no capitalism doesn't lift people out of poverty that's not a marxist thing to say and i think i think i think you guys know that if you think about it a bit that's not a marxist thing to say when richard wolf says that he's being ridiculous that's that's so like ideological it's it's no. So okay. first point is that um, it's not the World Bank's definition. China has its own definition. It's about 100, 150 percent higher than the World Bank's, which granted low. But the fact that they able they were able to do it for 800 million people to the point where even Credit Suisse is saying publishing publishing reports saying that the average Chinese person is richer than the average American because our economic system is based on debt. I mean, it's substantial numbers that cannot be ignored. Simply, no. This is, that's the that's the world definition. Like when you're using if the 800 you, million, that's 190 if, a day. If you look at the actual studies that and the publishings that China puts out, where they have stated like this is what standard we hold to, it is higher than the World Bank's definition of absolute poverty. 
Yeah, sure. What is it? Could you like I mean, send me a like, link? Um, yeah, give me a sec. Um, Jaren, you got this thing. Let me uh, get this. Yeah, I mean, in the meantime, I'll hit, I'll hit the China thing first, and then there's something else just about the, uh, what is it, the, the NGL, the NDL, the whatever the hell. Um, but, uh, you know, with China, we we can't look at it through the same framework that we do, like something like the United States. So, and I've debated these guys too about my position when it comes to China. So we're very well acquainted. And like when Deng Xiaoping opened, reopened markets and when China got admitted into the WTO, um, yeah, that, that was free marketism infiltrating China, okay? And that did create an influx of wealth into China. But here's the caveat. It poisoned the shit out of the Yellow River. It poisoned the shit out of the Yangtze River. It dried it up. People were having, there was no such thing as an EPA at the time. Tons of people got tumors. Like there was a heavy, heavy, heavy price to that market liberalization that China experienced. And they kind of turned on their heel in a way, and yes, that wealth did end up trickling down to the Chinese people, which is great in some ways. But then in other ways, yeah, this free marketization of China really did some horrible shit to a lot of people. And that's not something that we can ignore. Um, both of these systems have managed to just screw the average proletariat. Um, now, as far as, you know, the non-aggression principle, that's what I was thinking of. One thing that really bothers me about lib right with this stuff is like, you don't consider it to be violent until it is physically violent. So, you know, when we look at somebody like, um, like hop or Rothbard or somebody yeah. like that, you know, they, they want to have this thing where, like, you know, radical free speech. And if you want to enclose an area and exclude black people or Jews, you should be able to do that and all this stuff. Because it's Based. inherently nonviolent, right? You know, if, if, if you're just saying racist things, that's not violent. But that omits the fact that, like, you know, I grew up a conservative Jew. I've studied more Shoah-related bullshit in my life than I ever wish that I had. Um, and, and the beginning of Shoah or the Holocaust didn't start with action. It started with the protocols of the elders of Zion, nothing but words. Yep. It started with words. Words are actions. Um, and when you say you're a free speech radical or, or like, you know, Nazis should have a platform as long as they're not acting on it. Not that you guys said that directly today. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. Um, or, or even some of the, the Hoppian ideas of like gated communities where you can exclude people. These are all seeds that blossom into physical violence and action. They don't just come out of nowhere. We can't pretend that violence doesn't start with what Lib Right would consider nonviolent. Um, and that is one of these situations where, like, I do agree with Ward on this. Like, I believe that there are some elements of racism and anti-Semitism that should be forcibly suppressed because they grow like a cancer and people die. Right. Um, you said there that, like, the problem with, like, the, the speech is that it grows into this physical action against people. So, and this would be a bad thing, of course. And so the solution of this is to engage in this physical action against people. Do you see the contradiction there? If physical action against people is the bad part, then why I, are we? No, I do why not, is this I the preemptive not, strike? I am not the Nazi because I want the Nazi gone. The Nazi has an initial thought that is that I should be gone. I didn't start it. So you want thought to prosecute thought crimes? If it I involves would, I, killing minorities, yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah, do you, if it involves do you, killing minorities, on what I grounds? Do. On what Hold grounds on, here, is this here, just? Me, let me let me do something real quick. So this is the thing I like to bring out a lot. Um, this is what I kind of lay out as the inherent definition between the left and the right, as opposed, like as far as like who they want to discriminate against. So when you talk about far rightists, they want to discriminate against Jews, trans people, minorities. Whoa, whoa, whoa! We like, don't want to do any of that. Not necessarily. I'm we think about, people but should you're, be allowed but you're okay to. with communities that do. We we think people should be allowed to discriminate against people. We think people should be allowed to not bake the cake, right? Ooh, That's their I mean, right. I think it's actually morally uh, just, and like, I think people are like morally obligated to stop those people from doing that. Why? Uh, don't you agree with freedom of association? 
you know, there's there's a there's an old no, adage. No, there's I an mean, old I adage that... that I learned from my bubby about this because she, she her sister was a Holocaust survivor. Um, and and I'm I'm sorry for being blunt, but if you're at a table with nine Nazis and one person who's sitting at the table willingly, you're at a table with ten Nazis. Okay, but what, where Nazis where is the just where is the justification in here for Good. criminalizing <laughs> thought? Where is okay, the justification so is, that thought is, is my, criminal? This is my point. If you are a Jewish person, person, you're trans, you're gay, you're black, whatever the fascists don't like, you cannot stop being that. The only way that those fascists will be happy is if you stop existing, and they are willing to use whatever force is necessary. They're willing to lie, cheat, and steal. They're willing to say that they're socialists. They're willing to be dishonest about their beliefs to get people on their side. They're willing to use religion. They're willing to use whatever means they're at their disposal to get their goals accomplished. And they will not stop until they can stop those people from existing. Now, the people on the left who oppose them oppose people who have voluntarily chosen those beliefs. You can stop being a fascist. You can stop being discriminatory towards those people, towards those marginalized people that I mentioned. So if you do stop doing that, the anti-fascists and leftists will leave you alone. And I'm, again, cribbing from philosophy tube here, they may not be your friend, they may not have a beer with you, but they will leave you alone. It is only the unrepentant fascists that leftists want to get rid of. And I think that that's why people always have to talk about, like, property rights, and again, abstract it, because they're not talking about, like, what they actually are willing to defend. And when you say, like, freedom of association, you want to, like, have these people, like, I guess, cordoned off in their own community to discriminate against who they want to. It's like, if they want to be fucked up. And I think that I know, but I think that that's great that you guys want to go out on that limb and defend that because we can say, actually, it's wrong for those people to do that and you should stop them. But on what grounds? You haven't actually given the grounds for it being wrong for them to associate. The grounds would be, and I'm, I'm going to make this as clear as I possibly can. The grounds would be that they want to murder people like me. But why does that imply that you're no longer, that you're suddenly allowed to overwrite their ability to exclude you from their property? Why does that overwrite that? Okay, I have a great example for this. So part of the assumption that you have is that if they're in their own community, they will stay in their own community. No, no, that's not the assumption. They might not stay in their okay. own community. But why okay, then how are, they, why like are they not allowed to exclude people I'm from just their property? Now, you guys have like Holocaust deniers in your chat on the YouTube, so I think that's fucking I, I don't care. What, uh, why the are they that? not allowed to exclude people from their property? I wasn't talking about excluding people from like. Start with that, if you start with that seed, it will grow beyond their property. You can even ex observe this with something like slaves escaping the American South into uh, Spanish held Florida. They ran down there, mingled with the Indians. That's what we came to know as the Seminoles, correct? And you would think because they're in an entirely different area that maybe they would be free in this area, you would think. But then, no. The American government sent people down there and took them back and massacred everybody else. And if you think that wouldn't happen with private communities as well, that they would have some sort of concession to hand over the Jews or hand over the blacks and we won't fuck up your gorgeous front gate, that would absolutely happen. Whether it would happen I, is like irrelevant. I said, I have, why don't I they have, have the right to exclude people? Why do you want the right to exclude people? Because it's a Again, basic I mean, right of property. That's what property well, no, means. It's the right to exclude. I was on the basis earlier, of race. That's messed up, dude. On the basis of whatever the so fuck you up. feel like. Uh, if I, I may. Not, um, okay, but I just uh, want to say real quick. I'm not saying that like it's wrong to you know discriminate by like just not letting people into your house. I mean like it's wrong to discriminate by saying like I'm a fascist and I want to kill minorities and that is my intended goal. And I'm going to use political power to get that goal or use whatever else, even if it's not political power, even if it's just like privately owned militias or whatever, like that could be the new iteration of fascism. That is the point. And I, again, I think you have to keep bringing it back to like, as if I'm making an analogy, like you have to let people of color live in your house or something. That's not what I'm fucking talking about. I'm saying it's wrong to be a fascist and it's right to discriminate against fascists because it's a voluntarily held belief system. And it comes down to discriminating against people on the color of their skin versus the content of their character. And so it's actually good to discriminate against people versus the, on the content of their character when they're fascist, get rid of them by any means necessary. It's that it's really simple. Like I like 
I don't I don't see why you guys don't quite get this right because there there seems to be this like good amount of overlap because yeah you can you you can discriminate against fascists you can socially ostracize them you can kick them out of your door you can kick them off your social media app yeah great like yeah 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 dude I I've I've reported freaking uh, Holocaust deniers on on TikTok and and crap like that yeah ban them I don't care screw them I, I had one guy he was like. I made a video and I was talking about the the history of uh, Christianity during uh, Nazi Germany, and this this Nazi got like really upset at me. And he was like putting all these anti-Semitic comments and crap. Most of my like heroes and, and intellectual heroes are Jewish, um. So I especially like, you know, you know, with all the influence I take from 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 uh, Jewish people, I I don't take any of that. Like, if people are gonna try to act like, oh yeah, you're on you're on my side with this, no, absolutely not. And I, I publicly shame them. I point out like, look at this, what this guy is saying. Uh, knew that like you know thousands of people would see it yeah like yeah but but when it when it comes to like uh who who should have the right to discriminate i don't see why you gotta like say okay well now they don't have the right to screen i think i think that's i think that hurts them even more honestly like when you're talking about like segregation i see it as ideological segregation not racial segregation they may think it's racial but they're the white supremacists they're not the white people they're not all the white people if they if they go segregate themselves it's white supremacists segregating ideologically not racially because i'm not going with them um i think that's great because i think socially ostracizing yourself or taking yourself away from the social division of labor embarrassing yourself etc cetera, etc cetera, is a bad thing i think i think you know, i think in many ways that can change many people's minds but like I don't see why you must inici initiate force against somebody because they're like, oh yeah, I'm freaking freaking racist. It's like, no, like, yeah, socially ostracize them, discriminate against them, ban them off the social media apps. Totally. All for that. Great. Like, I mean, but, and then one last thing, I feel like you often, you guys, when you're hearing this stuff, like, oh, the Nazis, oh, people who hate Jews, whatever you just like, oh, gross, gross, gross. It's like, well, yeah, it's gross, but I, I feel like, need a, it's it's a lot more than that. i feel like it's a lot more than oh this is bad because it's gross because i feel because that's what they think they think it's gross they think black people are gross they think jews are gross like i think it's i think our opposition to nazis our opposition to racism to anti-semitism should be a lot deeper than just it's gross which i think it is for you guys but you're making it seem like you just it's, it's just it's gross yeah i mean i get that i mean i think actually the right has their politics far more based in disgust than the left, and there's like a lot of, uh, I don't know, more based. I, I, what's that? <laughs> no, but uh, um, yeah, I think yeah. When you say like, why is it right to discriminate against these people? Again, it just keeps going back to this thing that they voluntarily chose to adopt an ideology of discrimination against other people for things that they cannot choose. And again, like this is just my personal position as a Marxist Leninist. I just think whatever is done to those people who are unapologetic fascists is fine because they have just kind of like, it's almost like a John Lockean thing. I remember some Locke studies saying that like he made a distinction between like a man and a beast. And it's like, once you become the aggressor against somebody else's property or something, you're no longer a person, you're a beast and you have to be put down. It's like, that's how I feel about the fascists. Like they chose that position and yeah, whatever is done to them is fine. But again, at any point, they could literally just stop being fascist. I think it would absolutely be great to re-educate these people involuntarily and show them why it's wrong to be fucking fascist and then set them up with a job and a house afterwards. Like, that's a good thing to do. Uh, let me go with Serling, and then we'll go with Jaren. Wait, why are we going with me? I, oh, I, sorry. Hand up. <laughs> no, that that was a mistake. I'm just okay. in here, like, entertaining uh, Zulu's chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I found the chat like 20 minutes ago, and it's been very entertaining. What's up, Karen? You know, um, this is just one of those things where it's it's very tough to give insight without like framing the whole thing. Look, like I said, I've I've had the study show more than I've ever really fucking wanted to. Um, and yes, I do understand that like the the racism and stuff of Nazi Germany and the the xenophobia came from economic sources, which. I'm going to avoid attributing that to any sort of political system because that's not my point. My point is that um, when, when, you're, when you're just allowing the total freedom of all ideas and all markets, uh, one of the things that can happen and does happen is not everybody's up to snuff on their education. I think all of us can agree on that. 
And what inevitably will occur is something will infiltrate a certain group and cause them to think that Jews are shape-shifting lizards. Okay? And that, that maybe happens in some puritanical town in Texas that's in Encapistan now. And they're all by themselves, but like, you know, the Jews are shapeshifters. Um, this will inevitably manifest in somebody going out with a gun to a local synagogue at another Encapistan town and blowing the heads off of a couple of Jews. That's what will happen. That is what will happen, because people are not all there. And as an anarchist, that is something that I would like to fix. I think that there should be robust education for everybody. Lucy Parsons said it herself, that before any social change can proceed, we must see an epoch of education. And we should listen to those words. We have to, people need to understand what the bullshit is. They can't get through anything else without understanding what the bullshit is. And if we would just expect that these, these microcosms of civilization that are, that are working next to each other but separate from each other would somehow exchange this in a way that we can just keep the peace and none of these racists are going to pick up their guns and blow my fucking head off, that's insane. That's insane. And I say that it's insane from the perspective not only of anti-capitalism, but guess what? The Soviet Union did fucked up shit to my people too. They did. Stalin called us rootless cosmopolitans and, and initiated a whole campaign against us. And the capitalists did it throughout Tunisia, South Africa, and the Levant to establish the state of Israel. Like, we get fucked no matter what. So really the only thing that can help somebody that's in this position is just listening to the marginalized. And even beyond myself, because I'm, I'm white as a ghost. You know, I'm not like Jewish passing if somebody were to see me on the street. but like. You know, look at all of all of these these black activists. The majority of them are leftists. Look at these native activists. The majority of them are leftists. Like they have something to say that if we don't actually open our ears and listen, it's not going to get across because you're not going to get that experience. It, it drives me crazy when I get that question of like, well, why should we sequester the racist? Because they'll kill me. That's why. It's no deeper than that. It's not a hypothetical situation, which is what I always get in these debates is like, well, how do you weigh this against these ethics and these ethics and that, that are just like completely removed from reality. Whereas I'm over here seeing 1488 on this motherfucker's pickup truck outside of my neighborhood who would kill me if it were legal. It's not a joke to me. It's not, it's, it's, it's not hypothetical, man. And that's what I try and get across in these debates. Right, so um, you guys still haven't given a proof as to why it's just to aggress against these mean people who are racist and all these other things, right? It might be the case that some of them will kill you, right? That might well be the case, but it's not by definition the case that they necessarily will kill you. If you can't attack the ethic, then you have no grounds to stand on. This is an argument, remember. It's not a feel like, oh, I feel like this is very bad. It's an argument. You have to demonstrate that it's bad, that you have to demonstrate that it's so bad that it's just for you to go ahead and violate their rights. You have to demonstrate this. So I have to this. demonstrate to you that Nazism is bad. No, you have to just demonstrate your thesis here. that it's just to aggress against Nazis. You have to do that. Well, I got nothing for you, buddy. I, I'm aware. I guess, well, hold on. I guess... What would be acceptable to you as a, a thesis as to why? Because I just don't understand why you're not. It's like if I know that these people want to kill me, like that is in their ideology and it's what they want to do as soon as they just get the political will to do it without consequence. Where, where's like, what is la the missing link there for you as to why it is good to stop them? The well, missing um, link would it, be some sort of, you know, step by step propositional proof that is just to aggress against someone. That's what I want. Okay, so I don't. I just don't see it as aggression. I think you're stopping the aggression. From it is happening. initiation of conflict, right? Okay. Well, I mean, so this is kind of my so thing. So by like, definition, we're getting, aggression. We got, I, I I did want to ask you: Is your stream going to stop exactly at seven? Like we got to stop right at the dot. No, it uh, it, uh, it stops when I click end stream. Okay. I mean, that's fine either way because I would like to just stop at seven anyway. But I mean, we can move sort of start to move into wrapping things up if we could. But yeah, I guess just to try to finish up that point, I just see it as stopping the aggression from happening because. This person is expressing an, an intent to kill people. But you don't just... know that they will go ahead and do this. 
They I might, mean, I might, I might, I might doesn't. say, I want every single black person to die. That doesn't imply that I will go ahead and kill any black people. It doesn't imply that. I mean, it, it definitely implies that. It's just no, like, it doesn't. You... I can say right now, I want every black person to die. This does not yeah. imply that I will kill a single black person. Well, it, because you aren't, you either don't have the means or you're not going to because there would be consequences. Like you would get arrested for doing but it. I, but I, like, it's, yeah, so it doesn't imply it. It doesn't imply that I'm going to go ahead and initiate conflict. It yeah, does not okay, imply so when it. I say, I guess we're, we're kind of quibbling about the definition of fascist because when I say fascist, I'm not saying people who just are edgy online and say a bunch of memes and just say things that have no weight to them. I'm talking about people who genuinely have a desire to end the lives of minorities if they have the opportunity to do so. You, you are acting upon a, a you are acting upon a flawed epistemology here. You are assuming people who who you know you you don't know that they will go ahead and initiate aggression until they do it. Okay. Right. Well, they I, they I may or may not. Ben, I do want to see what Ben and both Ward have to say, but I just love that you guys have to like bend yourselves into all kinds of. We're not bending like, at all. Say why it's. I mean, I can just. We're staying on this very okay solid fascists, ground here. Fascists are bad, and you guys are just like ah, touch it to hurt these fascists. Not good. Like, right, but I, wait, you you have, you have no have justification. You have no justification. You lack a justification because you have no solid philosophy here. No, I mean, I think I have a solid philosophy, which is that but you're wrong. Nazis are bad, and cool. I mean, we'll just see holy how, shit. We'll just see how people feel about that. That's. I think this is you guys going mask off, and I love that. But Ben, what did you have to say? <sighs> Sorry. Yeah, I mean, you guys are talking about, oh, you're using hypotheticals, but I think this argument that you guys are using is a hypothetical, right? Because you, you are assuming, you know, like, whoever it is that I'm calling a fascist is, in fact, somebody who's going to initiate force. I mean, of course, oh, no, you know, there's I mean, ethical things, like, should you initiate? Like, like I, mean, I mean, you're saying, like, oh, well, I mean, of course, there's, like, edgy people online, but, I mean, yeah, I mean, that is a, that is a, big, that is a big deal, even if you're saying, right, right? Like, I mean... Something I hear a lot is, oh, yeah, it's okay to initiate violence against fascists, punch a, punch a fascist, punch a Nazi, whatever. But then the same Marxist later on will be like, oh, well, yeah, I mean, Republicans are, are, are Nazis. All Republicans are Nazis. Of course. Democrats, too, of course. The liberals, liber liberalism leads to fascism. They're fascist. And then it just goes on from there, right? So, yeah, we do see a lot of problems with it. And like I said, yeah, freaking discriminate in every way against fascists and Nazis. Uh like, yeah, I mean, and then on the other hand, you know, I'm a, I'm a young right wing creator. I'm a young white right wing creator creator who's who's very conservative in many ways. So I know I, I, I encounter a lot of Nazis and fascists and I've seen a lot of them get better, so to speak, get better. You know, like I, I know a lot of people who are formerly fat. They were just totally screwed in that. They were freaking dumb 14 year olds and they they get groomed into it basically by, by evil, evil, horrible people. And they were evil while they were while they were fascist, of course. But some people get out of that, and then, and then like killing people who are who have been groomed in, in, in these situations or, or attacking them and stuff like that when they have no intent to commit violence. It's like no, but I mean, if you, if you want to discriminate against them during that time, like, yeah, I mean, yeah, they sh they should be. It's, it's, it's completely justified. I think yeah, I think you have a valid point about like arguing about who is classified as a fascist and who gets to determine who is and, and who is not a fascist and everything and that's obviously like the where the slippery slope arguments come in and all the other stuff you might want to get into but like yeah i just start from the point of it's okay to discriminate or just stop fascists from doing violence to other people and i think in practice the way that it looks is like if you start going after the most extreme fascists a lot of them will renounce their views because they would rather do that and go on about their merry way than continue to espouse those horrible and bigoted views perhaps and, or you could create martyrs and make it worse no. well i think what would most likely happen if you just continue to do if you actually have a directed and intentional project of doing that on some kind of scale then you would see a lot less people uh adopting those views and then you wouldn't have to like keep you know that elimination is uh, you know, what do you call it, like death cult mindset of just keep going further and further and going after then the liberals and the Democrats or whatever. Like, I just don't think um, we would have to get to that point. But I did want to see, sorry, Jaren. Yeah, I would, I, I, I wanted to hear what um, Jaren said. Uh, if yeah. I may just say one more thing. Um, uh, one of one of our intellectual uh, leaders, Mises, um, in the 20s in his book, Liberalism, he writes about the, the rise of socialism, especially in Austria. And he talks about 
how the fascists were using like these aggressive methods against the socialists, you know, while the fascists were in charge. And he's like, you look, I'm anti-socialist. I, I don't like these, these Bolshevik guys and all this, but no, you look, what you're doing is you're creating martyrs. You're making the problem worse. This is an unsustainable solution. You could, you should beat them in the uh, marketplace of ideas, so to speak. Right. And he actually, there's this guy, Otto Bauer, who was the leader of the Austro Marxists, and he was actually going to start another uh, Bolshevik revolution in Austria. And Mises actually convinced him not to, but then, 20 years, less than 20 years later, writing about the Nazis, um, Mises is like, yeah, annihilate the Nazis, destroy the Nazis. You, we cannot have peace until they are all, all dead. So yeah, I mean, but but this was after you saw them initiating force. This was after you saw them taking political power and stuff like that. So, you know, in the effort of extending an olive branch here, I'll, I'll say this much is, you know, I, when... When I can, I prefer to be an abolitionist. And I would like for people who are put into the position of growing up around fascists to have a chance to reform that. Um, ideally, that's the case. But I will say this as someone who's in their mid-30s and had to study all this shit so fucking much. Um, and especially during COVID, it, it was just bullshit because people are posting you know, pictures of bodies in pits and saying this is what happens if you let the vaccine mandates happen and I'm wondering if my cousins are in that fucking pit. Um, you can't defeat these people in the marketplace of ideas and you cannot get some of them to reform and in a way they're very stupid and in another way they're very cunning. Um, and, and the thing about the fear that comes from economics when you can't afford something like look at the German population prior to world war two, they, most of them came from world war one. They came out of a horrible, horrible war. First one with modern technology that had that scale of bloodshed and you know, they're in their fucking teens. They come back, they work for a decade and then they're in their thirties and they can't afford anything. And they weren't sure what to make make of it. So when there is a charismatic figure that says that like, oh, well, you know, black people commit X amount of crime or Jews do this or Mexicans do that, it's a lot easier than studying the, the macroeconomics that I think all of us in this chat are at least familiar with, whether or not we disagree. Um, and I think that that's something really important that I don't, I don't want to sound like old man Jaron over here, but like if younger people will listen to older people about this, it's a problem. It's a scary problem. And it's something that could happen anywhere. Um, and that's part of why I do take the platforming of, of you know, these or people that fit particular dichotomy so seriously is, is like, for example, um, there's this guy named Lucian Greaves that worked with the Satanic Temple, and he ended up platforming a bunch of, of Nazis under being like, well, I don't agree with them, but they deserve free speech. And lo and behold, now Lucian Greaves' organization, the Satanic Temple, has a bunch of people that are intersectional with Nazis. It spreads like that, you know? Um, and, he, and some people do that thing where they're like, well, I don't believe in the Jews or lizards part, but I, I do think they have too much money. You know, they'll cherry pick just enough. And you're still part of the party if you cherry pick. Um, I don't know. That's all I got. But uh, I know we're running out of time. So, Sterling. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about Zulu was explaining some of his thoughts on, I guess, I idea crime, thought crime. And my thing is, if you were going to do it the right way, if we had a school system or any form of education that actually taught what fascism was, what led to the rise of the Nazis, because everyone, when you, when you talk to a regular person and you say the Nazis are bad, they say, yes, the Holocaust was bad. The Nazis were a lot more than the Holocaust. The Holocaust is it, it, doing the Holocaust is not being a fascist. That is something a fascist does. That's something fascist in history did. But the definition of fascist is not the person or the people who do the Holocaust. And I think. That's something we're not taught in school. That's something that our education system and certainly our, our corporate media completely falls on its face from explaining. We, we don't teach anyone in this country what fascism is, 
how it starts, where it can lead, what the dangers are, what the realities are, how tr- how prevalent it is in our own country. And then we get surprised when someone just picks up a tiki torch because his neighbor, you know, started saying how Jews were lizard people or whatever Jaron was saying. Like, if you don't have education, any information sounds convincing. So we're in a country where we don't have the first part. So people are very susceptible to the second part. Now, it's very easy for a capitalist to brush that off as as failures of the system and, and this and that. But the truth is, that is by design. Because if America started actually describing fascism and teaching fascism, the problem would be the people wouldn't be able to differentiate it between America and capitalism. Because the truth of the matter is... Fascism is capital, or capitalism is fascism. Fascism is, at the very least, the primary tool and the primary goal of capitalism. You cannot have a successful capitalist state without fascism. They go hand in hand. Uh, maybe not one and the same, but they certainly are unseparatable, which I don't think is a word. <laughs> so, <laughs> my my point in this is, we keep saying the U.S. is not a good example of capitalism for all these different libertarian ideology, you know, idealist views. And that's the problem. When, when you're an idealist, you inherently don't believe in reality. You believe in fantasy, like, like Christians or uh, Harry Potter fans and stuff like that. When you're an idealist, you believe in ideals in ideas. We, we don't believe in that. We believe in actual material, what happens on the fucking earth. And so when you say things like the U.S. is not capitalist, that's ludicrous. It's bonkers. The U.S. is the perfect representation of capitalism because the U.S. has gone further than what people just learning what capitalism in universities understand. The U.S. has went so far into libertarian, far, truly unfettered regulation capitalism that it's installed its own government in which it controls, in which Blackwater Goldman Sachs, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, in which the capitalists actually not only have control of the government, have control of the state, because the state is, like I've said many times, the state is a tool. You can pick up a sword and attack your neighbor or defend your neighbor. The state is nothing but a tool. What you do with it determines what the actual ideology is of, of the state. So they have created this. They have control over it. And more importantly, They've replaced their own blame onto the government. So now these little right-wing Redditors that run around talking about helicopters in chat rooms, cosplaying f- these random ideas that they've, they've heard online, they believe that it's the government's fault. It's crazy. They, they've actually taken the blame. These people who are pressing, you guys sitting right here in the chat with me, who suffer oppression every single day, who are living lives that you wish were better. There are people with names and addresses responsible, and you think this old man with dementia is apparently calling the shots of the White House. It blows my mind, and I'll end um, there. I'll tell you what yeah, blows, it, I'll tell you what blows my up? mind. We'll let is, these guys finish it can up. I get a source is, for that? <laughs> no, no, no. I'll, I, we don't even need a source for that. I'll tell you what blows my mind about that whole thing is you said, well, you know, the government did all these things and it was all bad and bad, 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 bad. And then people have the audacity to blame the government for all of it. Y- yeah, because you just explained how the, go- yeah, government, the government, government did it all. An and uh, I'll also finish off on, uh, you know, I asked earlier for proof of your guys' ethic, right? And, uh, you know, uh, Jaron over here. He said, no, I don't have any proof. We don't have a proof for our ethic. So that's the ultimate concession there. We have a proof for our ethic. You don't have a proof for your ethic. We win, I, I you lose. You, proof. you just didn't like Yep, it. you sure do win, buddy. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's great that you guys think saying it's not okay to attack Nazis is a win. I think that's... Mm-hmm. That's yeah, that's, that's, didn't say that. quite, it, it, that's uh, quite a win. It's not okay to initiate aggression against a peaceful individual. Yeah. I'll make that sure I like, call you if I need any help. I'm trying, trying to do this <laughs> so, whole thing. So right? aggression like, is stay. only mm. physical. Yeah. Aggression is only physical. It can't no, be aggres- economic. Aggression, it can't be verbal. Aggression oh, is hey, the initiation wanna... of conflict. That is the definition of aggression. It's the initiation mm-hmm. of conflict. Not yep. physical conflict. It can't conflict be a guy on a is defined. Conflict is like defined as Got contradictory it. action. 
Well, yeah, gentlemen, not, not this has been very educational. And, you guys still uh, don't have your proof. You still don't have your proof. What? We have our proof. My, okay. You don't. Like someone, my proof is my dead head. fucking relatives, dude. That's not a proof. What the hell do you want? That's not oh, proof. Oh, good. That's not good enough for you. I, no, it's, I, it's simply not shit, proof. Man. Your relatives really dying really is not a proof of any ethic. That but Nazis is, yeah, will I would, kill I would people. See your dead relatives as a good argument against socialism. So I mean, that's pretty meaningless, right? That's completely uh, arbitrary. Are you that's saying the Nazis were group. socialists? Yes. <laughs> the National Socialists. Hold me. No, 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 no. Okay, yeah. stop. I wonder why they Wall call Street, themselves that. Hold on. I'll debate Wall, any of you guys on this. Wall anytime, Street financed anytime. those people. Because Wall, Wall Street's fucking Nazi party as it was infected with socialists. Could, could I get a source for that? Actually, there's a great book by there's Henry Ashby Turner. There's a whole Ashby book Turner. on I have it, it on dude. My, I have no, it. I love this. I love that Wall Street is socialist, right. America is socialist, capitalism yeah. is socialist. Like it's, no, no, it's no. All, capitalism already, is not socialist. It's the negation of socialism. We've already won. Like The socialists have taken over the entire you've, world. I've you've already won. You <laughs> conceded the entire ground of the debate. <laughs> What's wrong with no, you? I mean, here we go. You, you conceded that you have no proof and that we have a proof. I haven't conceded that because I don't know what your proof is. Your proof is just... Like oh, I gave you my right proof earlier. And then property rights are I'm presupposed what a, what by proof anybody who like. engages in argumentation. That is the proof. What? Okay, so, what? like, dude, what I'm saying is that, like, it's okay to stop people from aggressing against others when they express their... No, 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 no. You said it's okay to others. aggress against people. I have it written down here. Yeah, you said it's I okay said to it aggress against people because they're mean, right? I don't see that. Uh, no, you have to straw man my argument because you can't actually attack. Me. I'm I'm not but, straw manning you, bro. No, you definitely are. But like, I'll work. I'm again, not. Because somebody else in your chat asked again my definition of fascism, so I will repeat it. It is fascists are people who want to discriminate against people for those Marxist socialism <laughs> inherent characteristics that they cannot control, um, like you know inherent. And this is not aggression. Like they're no, uh, well, I'm saying if they express... And you think it's just to aggress intent. against these people. Yes, because you're stopping them Yes, from doing you it. think it's just to aggress against people. This is what we disagree with. It's unjustifiable okay, to aggress well, against I'm, anyone. Hold on. You're lying about your position. You're I'm you're cool with Nazis being Nazis. Mike is not cool I'm with not, Nazis I'm being I'm not Nazis. cool with Nazis being hold, Nazis. Just as I'm not cool on, with you guys go, being I mean, socialists come on, either. Come on. Then I see your book and I appreciate the title and I will exchange that with you for Nazi or I'm sorry, Hitler and the Rise of Wall Street or Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler. We'll change yeah, yeah, books. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 as I for the rest book. of this, right I'm there. out. Yeah. yeah, we gotta wrap um, it up. I mean I don't even think we really need to do plugs. We're on your channel. I think we can. But let me just say, like, I know this we is can getting talk spicy about this the after end. we stop recording. I'd have, yeah. Well, no, because I want to keep it on the recording. Like, I think that these are all oh, valuable okay. conversations. I mean, no, and I'm talking about like the national socialism thing, right? Wall Street, well, no, you know, I would it, rather just. I think that's a really long conversation. I want to have you guys come back. Come back and do it again. I would like to do this a whole bunch. Of, like, this uh, was the fun argument. Did you guys not have fun? Well, I, I fun. mean, yeah. It wasn't good content though. You don't I'm think not going to so? repost this. this. Like, no, oh. not really. Damn. Like, I feel like. I don't, know. I don't I mean, think I, I would I post it from that either, but our our fans will love it. Yeah, I mean, this is like what we. This is what we. I mean, I guess you're, you're not listening to our podcast, so it's like you got you got to kind of just chill and have conversations. Like uh, that's the winning side usually is comfortable posting it. I'm currently posting this. Well, yeah, it's, it's streaming right now. Okay, take, like, take. I'm, just not post I'm a professional. Look, like I'm a, I'm a professional. Uh, yeah, well, exactly. this guy's got two hundred thousand followers, yeah. so I, I, yeah, I exactly. imagine most of them are not bots. I hope I don't know. I, I per like. I personally thought Prax been. been yeah. I really want to invite you guys back again to do it again. I know this got like heated here at the end, but I want to yeah. do this again. And, and I've been looking for that was my intention with all this. I want to have like repeat guests who come back and do this on the regular. So please come back again, you guys. I'm sure so if you if you give me access to the maybe. server, I guess uh, you know. Yeah, yeah I definitely will. Oh, we need to we need to have this better though. Freaking the way too many people. There's way too many people. Like, yeah, I I think I think it was fun. I think I think all you guys had interesting stuff to say. I mean, I'm not sitting here like, oh, you guys are freaking gross. I hate you. No, like it was fun, but too many people. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. That's a fair criticism. But I mean, like I said, we all just wanted in because we saw your TikTok channel and we were just very heated. Didn't I mean, like, excited to do this. So yeah, I'd love to talk to some people individually. That would be more fun for me. I like that. Cool. All right. Well, unless anybody else tells us anything, I'll just end the stream here or the uh, the recording here. Thanks again, you guys. Take care. All right. Yeah. See ya. Jesus Christ, these guys were fucking. That was something, wasn't it? Huh? I, I, I maintain that they have no proof of their ethic. They admit that they have no proof of their ethic. 
I have a proof of, proof of my ethic. This is a concession of the debate. Admitting that you have no proof is a concession. I'll just end it there then. <laughs>